Hello, welcome to this course. My name is Casey Shah. It is my immense honor to have you in my course, and I really mean it. While I'm super excited, I am also a bit nervous. What am I nervous about? I'm nervous about delivering on the outcomes that you might be expecting. To that end, I have spent hundreds of hours in creating this course. I have put my two decades of experience and expertise in creating this course. Now it's time for us to work together. Cloud computing is one of the hottest technologies today. Cloud computing revenues has grown from mere $1 billion in 2012 to over $200 billion in 2018. The revenues are expected to cross $1 trillion by 2022. Yet, most of the experts say that cloud is in its infancy. What does it mean for you and me? It means that learning about the cloud, mastering the cloud, and getting certified with the cloud technologies is going to be our ticket. The reason you get certified, cloud technologies or not, is to prove your expertise. It's like your SAT, GRE, GMAT test, right? Your knowledge has been tested by independent third party who certifies that you have this kind of knowledge. Similarly, in IT certifications, your knowledge is verified by the vendor, such as cloud computing vendors, for example, Google, AWS, Microsoft, and they verify that you are competent with these technologies. So it really gives employers confidence that you are competent and you'll be able to do a great job in their environment. So that's general logic for getting certified. Now I'll turn to more specific reason why you should get cloud certified. Cloud computing is relatively new, relatively new. It's only 10 years ago, AWS started it, and more so in last four years, 2014 to 2018, is when cloud computing came to the forefront of things. Cloud certification is even newer. So there are relatively small number of cloud certified professionals, relatively small. There are a total of 45 million IT folks, including developers, system admins, network engineers, so on and so forth. There are 45 million of those in the world. There are less than 10,000 cloud certified professionals today, much less than that, actually. So you are a unique person. You are just, just put simple math of supply and demand, right? I mean, you are in high demand because cloud computing revenues are growing rapidly. They are doubling and tripling the revenues each vendor is. So demand is rising, but there aren't enough certified professionals out there. It means that you're going to be in high demand for now and for foreseeable future. You're gonna enhance your career path, you're gonna grow faster, you're gonna enter a new career if that's what you desire, and you're gonna recession-proof your job for foreseeable future. And, and you know, if you get multi-cloud certification, especially, think about it, if you get several AWS certifications, several G GCP, Google Cloud certifications, several uh, Azure certifications like MCS, MCSE, let's say you have six of those combined, you'll be one in maybe 30 people in the world to have that combination. So you are going to really enhance. You're going to put your career on fast track. You're going to write your own salary check. You're going to define your own compensation package. So time is now to get cloud certified. So let's get going. Once again, thank you very much for signing up for this course. It is my tremendous honor to have you on board in this course. KC Shah, thank you. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. In this video, I'll walk you through practice exam based training format that I have come up with. As you may have heard me in my introduction lecture that I have taken over 100 certification exams through the success and failures. Yes, failures as well. I have learned a lot. One of those learnings has translated into innovation of this practice exam based training format. 
Before I go into the details of the formula, let me explain you the problem that I'm trying to solve. Traditional courses, including many of my courses, are what I call sequential courses. For example, in case of cloud computing, I start with why you need cloud computing, uh, what are regions, what, are, what is zone, what is a compute engine, what is a storage, what is database, and then what are platforms, machine learning, data analytics, so on, so forth, on and on. And these courses become 10, 20, 30, 40 hour courses. Udemy and others have done some research and found that only one in 10 learners reach the end of the course. Even though all 10 of them have given great reviews, so they like the course, but they just do not go to the end of it. The one who goes to the end generally succeeds, especially in certification exam focused courses. So to increase the engagement, Udemy and others recommend micro learning, so short courses, short lessons and really focused on outcomes. I've been thinking about this problem for a while and a year ago uh, I, I tried a different approach. I came up with this format called practice exam based training. The way it works is I teach you, I give you 30 questions, highly curated, focused, similar degree of difficulty uh, as actual exam, 30 questions. I have broken it down in three set of 10 questions. Question one through 10, 11 through 20, and 21 through 30. So the way I start is I give you an outlining format, you know, just a blank template that you need to fill out along the way. Before I give you any question, I give you a really fun one hour Google exercise, Google search exercise. So I tell you that, you know, search these items and then fill in information in your outline. Not exactly matching the question I'm going to ask, but somewhere around there. So it'll be one hour exercise. You do Google search, you learn the information, and then you have 10 questions in a quiz format that you will answer. Then I'll explain each question in a video format. I'll give you PDF as well. And then we go into the details, substantive detail of the topic touched by that question. I follow those, some of those questions with hands-on labs. I, I show you or I, you know, I demonstrate to you how to build compute engine, for example, virtual machines, auto scaling, uh, or whatever that topic requires, virtual private cloud, networking, load balancing, security aspects, you name it. So I connect the dots that way. Then I move on to the next 10 questions, next 10 questions. So you have the 30 questions, 30 video answers, 30 PDF answers, substantive material concept covered in those questions in various topics of those covered in, the, in that particular practice exam based training. And then you learn. At the end, I synthesize the whole course technically. So I say, you know, these are the things, very high level key points that you learned. Revise it one more time. You know, again, go in some depth of those topics and then we finish this. It's about three or four hour course. So, you know, instead of going sequentially, I sort of have changed this to practice exam based and I have I've tested it on uh, one of my courses. I have seen great results in my other course. Nine out of 10 of my learners reach the end of the course. They complete the course. I have gotten 4.97 out of five reviews from dozens of reviewers over the last year. So I have expanded upon this format and this course is based on this practice exam based innovative and disruptive format. I have more details in the attached PDF document. Make sure to download and go through that to learn more about this format, how exactly it works. Thank you very much. Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Certs. Bye bye. Welcome to Hello Cloud Certs. Say hello to your future. My name is Casey Shah. This video is about AWS EC2 exam focus notes. This is the summary section for EC2. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute. It's one of the first, perhaps second, I think, after S3 services that AWS offered for their cloud computing. So AWS EC2 provides computing services, their flagship product these days, uh, one of their highest revenue generator. 
EC2 dashboard provides several capabilities related to deploying EC2. So it's not just a deployment of a server. I will briefly walk you through the EC2 dashboard. It does have various other services. And I cover those in indi individual lectures, individual videos. For, for example, load balancer is part of EC2 dashboard. And I have totally separate lecture on that video on that and uh, there, you know there are several other sub services like auto scaling for example for ec2 uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see like a bunch of other services so i'll walk you through that and we'll go through that ami ami you're gonna hear a lot about if not already is called amazon stands for amazon machine image it is a template it's not really an OS itself, it's a template that contains software configuration for an EC2 instance. So AWS and all the cloud providers have done a pretty good job of separating out the, the, the configuration piece from the operating system. So template tells you what the user requested, such as host name, the storage amount, the type, and all that information is in a template. And EC2 instance is rolled based on that configuration combined with the operating system image and launching it as an instance. EC2 instance keeps running until you stop it or terminate it. So it's going to be running in the background or foreground and it, you're going to get charged until you stop it or terminate it. EC2 is built on a per second basis. This is relatively new. AWS was building on a per hour basis for a long period of time. Google Cloud started building on a per second basis and AWS followed suit and uh, they started building on a per second basis as well. For only for Linux instances, for Windows, perhaps for licensing reasons, uh, they still charge based on a per hour basis. When you stop an EC2 instance, important for all your exam preparations, EC2 instance, you do not get built for the compute. However, you do get built for the storage, persistent storage. If you are booting off of an EC EBS volume, for example, they'll continue to be built when you stop an instance. But if you terminate an instance, billing for... EC2 compute instance is gone, and by default, your default, your. All right, let's talk about this question. HCC AWS PQ 1322. Call of the question when admin sees the bill for this server, compute time, what should she expect? Okay, let's read the fact pattern. EC2 Windows instance. Okay, Windows instance, remember that. Windows charged differently. SRV01 has been running for three days, 12 hours. So we'll write three days, 12 hours, and 15 minutes. This is the running state and 24 seconds. That's the running state. One of the systems was infected, was stopped. So it remained stopped for six hours, 16 minutes and 28 seconds and then it was ran again for two days and was terminated in the end it was started here probably and terminated so that's the life cycle of this instance when you see the bill what should she expect when she sees the bill she should expect Charge for five days, 13 hours. Five days and 13 hours. How did that happen, right? Let's see. So Windows machine, so what is charging? Per hour charging for Windows. Per second for Linux. Per hour for Windows. Okay. So we got three days, 12 hours, 15 minutes, 24 seconds. So what would this portion be charged at? 13 hours so you got three days and 13 hours so three plus 13 and you got two more days so five days and 13 hours it's rounded to the next number so it, 
you don't round it to it's 15 minutes only 12 hours no even for one minute it's gonna be 13 hours so three days 13 hours and two days here the stop instance this it stops accruing charges for the compute when you stop an instance so zero charge here so it's gonna be five days and 13 hours bit of math involved but not too difficult five days 13 hours is your answer take it up difficulty i put it at 75 because math is involved and some people don't like math but it's not too difficult concept to know here is windows charge per hour basis rounding is to the next hour even for a single minute or a half minute and stopped instances do not accrue compute charges those three concepts that should do it for this question welcome to hello cloud search this is aws hands-on lab the topic for this lab is ec2 for aws that is elastic compute second generation uh, for amazon web services the lab id for this particular lab is hcc aws lab 1034 the scale difficulty scale is 60 65 is average so this is below average easy lab first version of the lab the objective for us in this lab is to create your first ec2 linux instance if you have created one before this may be reputation for you you already know about it you might want to quickly go through it or maybe not it's up to you but this is for folks who have never deployed ec2 instance uh, it's important for your certification training whether it's associate or professional you will need to know this this is the basics of aws so once again if you have done it maybe more than say five times you probably don't need to do it but if you have done it once six months ago three months ago you might want to go through it one more time here here are the high level steps as in all the labs i'll give you high level steps and i'll walk you through log into the console as an iam admin user not the root user there's a difference there iam admin user if you have not created one go to that iam lab and do that first go to the, then ec2 service and create an instance click on that and then follow the wizard and at the end it's going to ask you to create either a new key or use an existing key that's the ssh key to log into the server you can create a new key and um, uh, you can then download the key to your computer i will be in this particular lab using mac but you can also use windows i will have a windows version of the same lab available to you as well so change the permission on the key to make it private uh, otherwise system will not allow you to log in and then you ssh into your um, server that you deployed you need to find out the public ip address from the console i'll show you how then you type a few commands to see the system is alive and well and working for you let's see what else we have aws certification relevance always all the aspects of uh, what we do is uh, certification training and this hands-on lab it will help you if you are in uh, in the business in the profession or trying to be a cloud engineer even though you're not trying to get certified it's going to help you but for certification folks folks who are trying to get certified ec2 is a very important topic right one of the core topic without the server uh, you may have some serverless and other applications but for the most part server is going to be um, one of the required resource for most of the services and so it's going to be important topic for aws certification exams approximately three to seven questions uh, depending upon uh, what you get your luck and the the type of test you receive for associate level uh, certification exams for aws highly encourage you to do at least two labs more likely maybe more than that to be more comfortable with it and then process of going through hands-on lab always always reinforces and helps you become better at uh, aws and uh, make you understand the concept underlying concept much quicker than without doing the lab so i strongly encourage you to do 
several labs, not just for this topic, but other topics as well. For further support, if you have any questions or you want to participate in a discussion forum, we hold a free discussion forum you can participate in. You can send email uh, to get more support. Uh, you can ask question on uh, either a Facebook page or any of the number of platforms that I provide. Okay, and then references, if any. Uh, let's see, you can type uh, EC2 tutorial and limit to AWS site by this uh, site colon, and you're gonna get directly there or EC2 documentation, and then it's gonna take you there as well. So a lot of information on uh, AWS website for that. If you haven't done so, get your free to your access, and then based on this lab, try a few of your own scenarios as well. It's definitely gonna help you. So let's go back up here. Uh, our charter is to deploy an EC2 instance. So let's see. So I'm gonna be at the IAM login screen. That's my IAM site, my IAM username. I'm gonna log in. And I'm logged in as IAM user to my IAM site for this particular account. EC2, we will search on EC2 and then get to EC2 service. And once we are there, as I said, either um, launch instance straight away or you can go to instances and launch instance. And I'm gonna select Amazon AMI, the default first one with SSD, T2 micro eligible for free tier, so you would not be charged. Take that as an option so you can deploy more than one instances at the same time you can say two or five or twenty uh, you can request spot instances let me use my marker here you can also request spot instances that we'll talk about that in spot it's going to pick the default vpc that you would have when you start your account so it's going to put this into that we're going to talk about more in vpc labs and the lectures also needs a subnet so it's going to put it in default subnet auto assign ip it's going to use the subnet so whether it will get dhcp assigned ip in this case my subnet has it enabled which is a default and um, you can change that im role you can assign we'll talk about that to this ec2 instance and then uh, shutdown behavior uh, would be stop uh, enable termination protection you can check this to so that no one can terminate by mistake they have to override it so it wouldn't be terminated uh, programmatically um, or inadvertently through the console monitoring you can do detailed monitoring from this screen as well and tenancy default is shared you can change that you can do t t2 unlimited uh, if you're interested in bumping up the performance but this is uh, then it you'll be out of the free tier and you'll have to pay for that so let's click on the next add storage it comes with 8 gig of uh, ssd gp2 type of storage if you want to add volume we can do so let's not do that adding a tag we can tag this with a name uh, for example name we can say srv01 our first server in this case uh, we can uh, put other tags as well for example department would be training and then next ssh so this is security rule by default it gives you that create a new security group it names it launch wizard 2 you can change the name i do have an existing one but let's just take the default here launch wizard 2 is what it gave you you know um, you can change the name but uh, uh, say ssh 2 uh, EC2 instances, for example, and then review, launch, and it's going to give you everything you configured. If you want to change anything, you can do so by going uh, back here, uh, previous here, or go to up here. So you can make changes either by, let's see, clicking this previous button here, or you can straight away click on one of these previous links um, section links to go back okay let's launch it and then it's going to ask you to choose a, an existing key or create a new key 
Let's create a new key, say so EC2 key, straightforward. And then you gotta download that key. The key pair already exists. So let's say EC2 dash master key. Let's make it a master key, EC2 dash master key. I'm downloading AWS keys, EC2 dash master key. Okay, downloaded it somewhere in there, and then we launch the instance. And you go to the view instances, you're gonna see that it's gonna pop up pretty quickly. Launch SRV01 is spinning up. I have other instances that I can stop as well, just in case, let's see. I'm gonna leave that 100, I use that. Um, but SRV01 is the one we just launched. And the status here you see on the instant state. You may have different columns. I have probably customized this at some point, but no worries, it's pretty straightforward, just like any other web-based program. You can uh, customize the, the columns there. Uh, somewhere here but anyway so you, we are waiting so it's running already server one let's click on server one and that's the IP address or the DNS we can take either there is a copy let me show you I'll use my marker here this little copy icon here uh, if you see right here it's gonna pop up if I take my mouse there let's see See that? So that's the the copy. You can just call, click on that, or the IP address. You'll have to select and click it. So let's let's just do this. Uh, copy the DNS long name, but we don't have to type it, and we're good to go. So I'm using Mac once again. So I'm gonna fire up my terminal, and we can. This is my let's see local terminal here okay and I'm gonna go to that uh, directory where I saved it the key remember ls the key was ec2 master key so we are gonna do change mode 400 on ec2 master key C2 dash master key. Okay, so let's say uh, SSH minus I. You need to use username EC2. So you say EC2 minus I, EC2 dash master key. Then you have to use EC2 hyphen user. That's the default user. And then at sign and then the DNS name. Or we could have just put the IP address. I'll do both. So click on that. And we are inside the server, so host name, and we should be able to ping Google's DNS address. We should be able to ping AWS dot Amazon dot com, and we should be able. Let me clear the screen here. We should be able to yum update minus y sudo yum. It's going to update the system so let's go back here um, so we went to AWS ping uh, we did the sudo yum update and so on and so forth so we are inside the server and it's building up and we log in with IP address next demonstrate how that works let's see go here maybe in another window and we do cd to that key we need either it should be in the path or i need to get to that key like that ssh minus i there are ways to to add this so you don't have to type it every time i'm not gonna go through it in this lab and then let's look at the ip address of the server let's copy that 
and then we paste it here and remember we need to do ec2 user ec2 hyphen user at the ip address and we are in host name ping okay we can also do cls pwd we can do wget see cat so we downloaded the index HTML for AWS web page right there and we are in business pretty much uh, both sides here this is also our server and this is it if you want to change the host name you can do so as well um, you know you can change the prompt you can change uh, um, yeah, many things you want a ps1 for example equals to say my first aws server ssrv01 max slash w space dollar space so that you have working directory as well so you change the name of just the prompt not the host name still remains what you had it uh, there are ways to change that as well look for the notes in ec2 section for a lot more things you can do here i'm not going to go through all of that in this first build out of your ec2 server so there you have it uh, really straightforward um, and you know we can real quickly do another one use the same key just launch uh, select and you can say just review and launch really and it will do the rest for you to just take everything default and choose an existing ec2 master key launch an instance and it's that straightforward we can name it later on right now it's going to come up without any name which is just a tag we can add it we can add it now say srv02 while it's pending see it here it's in the pending state it's gonna come up in uh, running state pretty soon. Running server two, we have IP address here. You can have it down there as well. So with that, I can jump to my local host here. That's. Uh, my local system so I'm gonna change directory to my key SSH minus I EC2 master key EC2 hyphen user at IP address and it's gonna ask me for the first time and we are in and that's the host name you can change this to PS1 equals my second AWS instance SRV02 backslash W4 current directory space dollar space. There you go. So you, this one was your this one was your first server zero one, and this is your server zero two. You can ping each other. You can do so let's update that pseudo yum update minus y it's gonna update itself so what did we do let's recap we said we are going to build out a server let's see and we logged into the ec2 we we went through the visit we created uh, one server and then the second one as well created a new key that we used for the second server downloaded the key changed the mode used the key for ssh um, this should have been an ec2 hyphen user at so i will update that and then we typed these commands to make sure that uh, we can log in successfully 
And once again, EC2, very important topic for AWS Associate Level Certification exam. So make sure you you run through this and many other EC2-based exercises, hands-on uh, labs, as well as all the exam notes that I'm going to provide it to you. So um, thank you very much. Once again, this is Hello Cloud Certs. This lab was about AWS EC2, how to build your first Linux EC2 instance. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Certs. Let's look at this question together. HCC AWS PQ1278. Call of the question is where I like to start. What tool would you recommend using for the above scenario consistent with the best practice and the tool? Quick scan, add user to the access group. I am role, add user to a group. Use root user in Lambda. Okay. Now we got an idea what we're looking for. Let's read the fact pattern. You are a solution architect for the company, AWS our cloud environment. The company has deployed an application that will run, that will be Lambda function, uh, that will use Lambda function to make read API calls such as get, scan, and write API calls such as put or update, right? So Lambda function is involved to a DynamoDB table. Lambda function also write writes log files to CloudWatch, right? So Lambda is doing a bunch of things here. What tool would you use, would you recommend in this case, right? In terms of, uh, let's see what the question uh, options we have. The correct answer is B, IAM role that allows API calls to DynamoDB. So you will create an IAM role whenever one AWS service such as Lambda or EC2 for example, wants to access another service, in this case DynamoDB, or could be S3, or it could be S3 bucket, it could be by both, right? Now, in, in that case, always use role. One service need access to other service, use the role. Role would have a policy JSON document attached, and that policy will decide what this role can and cannot do, attach that role to these resources. That resources can now access or not access those resources, or access in a limited way if you want it that way. So you can control all that through central policy document. Other options, A, Add a user for this access and give this user the permission necessary to carry out the above task. Not a great idea to use user. It can be done, but not the best practice. Add a user to a group. Again, can be done, not the best practice. Use root user. Should never be done. Can be done, but not at all a good idea. Right? So the two are maybe okay ideas, not not in compliance at all with best practices, but it can be done in a pinch. You don't need to, but D should never be done. B is the right answer. I am role that allows API calls to DynamoDB. That should do it. That should fulfill all your requirements, and you as a solution architect going to recommend that. What would you recommend? That's what you would recommend. Degree of difficulty, 70. 65 about average, 70 right about average. Not a difficult question. You know, general trend, always look for IAM role. That's the right answer. AWS loves IAM roles. AWS loves auto-scaling. There are a few things that AWS proctors, examiners, they love it. And you want to make sure that you'll spot those. It's very less likely that whenever there's a role question, role is not the right answer. Similarly, for auto scaling, you know, for the most part, you still need to understand the concept, the question, and they can distract you with that as well. But just general trend, role is preferred. Okay, keep that in mind for your exam preparation. Thank you very much. My name is Casey Shah. If you have any question anytime, feel free to reach out to me via communication channels. You have that document, you have that video with you. Make sure to use that. Thank you very much. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. Say hello to your future. 
This is AWS Hands-On Lab for Identity and Access Management, IAM. The lab ID for this lab is HCC for Hello Cloud Search, AWS Lab 1022. That's the lab ID, this entire number here, the entire uh, string here. Difficulty level is 60. Uh, 65 is average, so this is a uh, rather easy lab. Version 1.0, objective is to create an IAM user and a group, and we log in with that username. So here are high-level steps. In, uh, in these labs, I'm not going to give you each and every step. I'll give you high-level steps, so it's sort of easy each and every step, but it's not going to tell you that uh, very precisely sort of screenshot by screenshot for that you'll have to pause the video watch the video again and try it yourself that's a better way to learn in my opinion so uh, you're gonna be logging in first as a root user let me walk you through at a high level and then you're gonna go into IAM as a service and then go to user you're gonna add a user while you're adding user you'll also create a group and add a group and we're gonna give permission to the group which permission? An administrator access permission. And that's called the policy. We're going to apply that policy to that group and by extension to the user that you created. So once that user has that access, admin access, we're going to have to log in as an IAM user. So remember, initially we logged in as a root user. Now we created an IAM user, so we're going to log in as IAM user. But it's a different website, different link to log in as an IAM user versus the root user. So you'll have to copy the IAM web address uh, from your account, the root account. So you're going to go there, copy it. You can also customize it. You will see what I have customized too has to be globally unique name and then you log out the root user log in as the IAM user and then you browse around the AWS console um, and then you create two additional users that's your homework I will create one user you create two additional users and that's how we finish this exercise um, now what is the certification relevance all my hands-on labs I want to tie it back to the certification because we focus on certification and AWS certification in this case. So IAM is a very important topic. It is one of the most important topics uh, of the AWS certification exams, especially associate level exams. Expect anywhere from two to six questions and depending upon your luck and your test, you may get two, you may get three, you may get six. Don't expect you to get uh, 10 or more, you know, like 20 or something out of 65, but that's approximate uh, number of questions you can expect. Which turn on I am may not be just creating a user or a group, but it's going to turn on your knowledge of I am. I highly encourage you to do at least two labs on this topic uh, for your associate level pre exam preparation. For a professional level, uh, you probably will have to do more than that. The process of going through the lab, even though for associate level certification exams, you can perhaps pass it without going through any hands-on labs, but it is my understanding and it is my experience that going through hands-on labs, and I believe that going through hands-on lab reinforces your theoretical knowledge. Over the years I have taken, and I've been certified with more than 25 various IT certifications, and I can tell you that doing hands-on, even though the exam may not actually require hands-on, you can probably learn it without it and pass without it, but it's, it's going to reinforce your knowledge, going to be more useful. It's probably the right way to do it. If you need further help, there are a number of ways you can reach out to me, and I encourage you to do so. There's also a free discussion uh, forum for certification. I encourage you to participate there as well. And then references, if you... Uh, Google with uh, IAM Tutorials AWS. Uh, I like to put site colon aws.amazon.com so all my searches are only from Amazon but if you want to open it up to third party tutorials for, for IAM you just don't put that site colon and you'll get it from the internet. Um, 
notes remember to get a free tier access if you haven't done so already and based on this hands-on lab i would like you to uh, try and implement a few of your own see if you can uh, hack a couple of labs yourself okay so going back up here uh, what we have set out to do high level steps here uh, so we're gonna try to achieve that we'll, essentially the goal is to create an IAM user and log in give them an administrator right and log in okay so uh, with that what we're going to do is we're gonna go to AWS uh, login page and I'm going to log in as a root user first because we don't have an IAM user, uh, although I may have one, I do have one, but let's pretend I don't. And then you're gonna go to IAM, you're gonna type in the search IAM, and you're gonna go into IAM, and you're gonna click on users, and then you add a user. Let's say user is student 001. Zero 01 student zero 01 and you want to give programmatic access as well as console access you can do one versus the other um, and that's fine too but you know if let's assume that we will require this account to access AWS both ways you can create a custom password uh, HCC rocks hello cloud search rocks user must create a new password let's unclick that for this lab in uh, practice you will have you should have a stricter password policy and must require you know special characters and whatnot but here I have not so let's do that and then I'm gonna create a group although I have one but I'm gonna add users to a group and that's what's selected and then let's say create a group let's create a new group so let's say admin group and then we can you know if you do just search on the policy you're gonna get all the admin policies up there and administrator access is the one I want to give you to this group so we added that group and gave that policy meaning that whoever is in that group would be admin and we are under the add user process and we added that group and then we're gonna go next review that so user we are creating a student 01 and put in the admin group created the user and we are done with that at this point it is important to download this CSV or show this these are your access keys so this is access key for this user and the secret key you will need that for CLI based configuration for uh, using this uh, user as an access so and this secret key will only show here once so you recommend it I recommend you to download that CSV and then you just save that CSV so you have that access and in CLI labs you will see how to use that for now we will not be using it and you can just close that so now that user is created the group is created if we check here uh, this is a new group admin group we created and we put the user in the group and we assign the role to the group see we have the group permissions administrator access and the user student one is in that group we can remove that we can add other users so on and so forth but that's enough for now we can now log in as that student 01 with hcc rocks as a password now uh, you see that account uh, right here that's your account number and uh, let's go back to im and you click on the dashboard and the dashboard here you know that number would have shown up here let me get my pencil in place here so this this one would have been a number before but now um, i have customized it and you can do so too so you can just click on the customize to um i can because i have customized if i click on it, it's going to remove it but if you customize it, you can put your own name or however you want to log in it's a sign in dot aws dot amazon dot com slash console and you just append your name so that's the URL I'm gonna copy here and 
uh, I can do one of two things. I can log out this root user or I can open an incognito window and then I can copy paste that URL and then I can log in as that student01. And I should be able to log into the console and I should be able to go in uh, into services and create resources, delete resources, I have full permission because I'm part of the administrator access. So that did not work, let's see. Maybe I mistyped the password. Okay, so it's trying to log in. If it doesn't work, maybe we'll change the password. So it did not work. I just want to show you live. It could happen. We go into the users. Uh, we create it, student01. We click on it, security credentials. Let's say the password, manage the password, custom password, H. Let me show you the password, H, C, C, R, O, C, K, S. Okay, apply, and then we go back to that CC ROCKS. That should log us in. For some reason, I may have mistyped the password, but I just wanted to show you live so you can, without editing this, so you can see that it can happen and how to change the password or update the password, and now we are in. Now we can just say, let's say S3, we create a bucket under S3. If we have permission, it will let us do so. Bucket, student01, HCC, east, fine, next. Just say next or create, could have just created it. Next and create bucket. On the very first uh, step, there is a create button bypassing all the options as well. Take the default options and uh, you can create it that way quickly as well and go ahead and change the options, but either way works. So it's creating bucket. That means we have the permission to do so. If it succeeds, then we know for sure that we do have permission. It's checking for, oh, your previous request to get a name bucket succeeded and you already own it. Okay, let's see. Refresh. Where is the refresh here? So we can... Go back, there's this refresh here on the right, use my pen to show you, it's a refresh button just for S3, you can also refresh the browser, so it's created the bucket and you can drop the files here, um, you can select the file, so essentially I don't want to go through S3 lab at this point, but you were able to create a bucket and therefore you have S3 permission, you have, you can probably go into, uh, let's say, billing as well. And as an administrator, you can go there as well. So we logged in as an IAM user. From this point on, uh, after you first log in as a root user, create your first admin IAM user. You're supposed to log in only as IAM user and not as a root user. Root user credentials, uh, this one, for example, should be deleted. So let's go to the users. Uh, uh, yeah, I have another IAM user, but if you go to root user credentials, it would be here somewhere, and then uh, you can delete uh, the access key and the secret key for the root user because you shouldn't need those. All you need is a console password for the root user. So there you have it. Uh, that was the lab. Let's go back here. Uh, did we accomplish everything we wanted to? We created a user, as we said. We added to the group. We logged in, and we have full access. So that is the basic, basic IAM 101 lab, just to create a user, IAM user, and log in. Give administrator access and log in as that user. That's it. Thank you very much. Once again, this is Hello Cloud Search. My name is Casey Shah. See you again. Bye-bye. Let's talk about this question. ID HCC AWS PQ 11761176. 
I start, I like to start at the call of the question based on the above, which of the following is true? Scan the choices. AWS must be notified, must be notified. Company did not complete. Company did not complete their pen testing in allowed time. So I'm looking for some policy. Let's see. Okay, so company wants to perform penetration testing. AWS and for internal auditing purposes. Company submitted a request on pen testing. So I would say submitted on this date. Asking to start on this date. Company received the approval on this date. Company started the testing. Started on this date and completed pen testing completed on this date okay so what is the right answer right answer is D company did not complete pen testing in allowed time per the policy and violated the terms of AWS pen testing policy so why did they not complete let's see how much time do they have company has 90 days so between the start let's call this the start and end you have 90 days to complete you can apply earlier so this is your initial request this is your approval so request made on february 22nd sorry february 10th they wanted to start on february 22nd in the request they mentioned that right 10th is when they made the request so this is this is 10th and then company received approval on February 20th. So this is F20, February 20th. And then company started their testing on 22nd. We noted that and completed on March 31st. So uh, May rather, May 31st. So we call it May. And let's spell it out, May there, okay? So February 22nd to three months or 90 days uh, is going to be may march april may it's gonna this date is going to be may 22nd or thereabout you know february is a short month and depending upon the year it's 2017 so not a leap year so roughly it's gonna be around may 22nd but they ended it on may 31st so they went over therefore violated the terms of the policy of the uh, aws penetration testing other options a aws must be notified and a finding report must be submitted incorrect must be notified upon the completion incorrect they don't have to notify upon completion they can be they don't have to share their data what their finding was you know even if they found any problem they are not required to let amazon know aws know the company did complete the company completed their pen testing in allowed time and did not violate the terms of AWS pen testing. No, they did, as we mentioned in um, choice D and my discussion above, that they did uh, violate by a few days. They went over by a few days, therefore not compliant with the policy. So that's it for this question, degree of difficulty. Let's look at that. It's about 65 for this question. 65 is right about the average I expect for this question. Uh, so don't get overwhelmed by these numbers here. It, the point I'm trying to make here is that you have 90 days to test in the penetration testing. Uh, so that's it for question HCC AWS PQ 1176. Thank you. Let's talk about this question HCC AWS PQ 1230. 1230. Okay. Start at the call of the question, which of the following approach will result in savings in operating AWS environment? We are looking at savings, quick scan of the choices, lifecycle glacier, lifecycle S3, lifecycle EFS. Okay, the startup has very little money, very little money, so money savings, but a lot of hope and potential. Their app is free. For the customers, data retention is important but not guaranteed. So they have an SLA with their free customers that doesn't guarantee data retention as a part of their service agreement Okay, when they sign up. Which of the following approach will result in savings? So with this scenario, what do you think they should do? That's the question. The answer is they should do A, 
set up S3 lifecycle policy, move the data from S3 standard tier to IA, to RRS, to Glacier. Okay, they can set up a policy to do so, and by doing that, they should be able to reduce their cost. Now, it depends on their schedule, you know, how, how long they want to keep it in standard, to IA, to RRS, to Glacier. It all depends on their business requirements, but that's a general policy that you can recommend. Other options, use Glacier for all customer data storage. Now, Glacier is mainly for archiving, not for real-time access. S3 lifecycle policy remove data from S3 standard to EBS. You cannot do that. Lifecycle policy only works across this standard tier to IA to RRS to Glacier. And use EFS NFS uh, version 4 file system. No, EFS would not save them money. EFS is not for storing large amount of data, such as customer uh, data for a free app. That will be S3 type of object store is more appropriate for that use case. But S3 standard would be, though it's inexpensive, it will be even cheaper if they apply this life cycle policy to move the S3 data from S3 standard to infrequently access to reduce redundancy storage to Glacier. Okay, so that should do it for this question, HCC. AWS PQ1230. Thank you. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. This is AWS Hands On Lab for S3. The objective is create S3 buckets from AWS CLI. The ID number for this lab is HCC AWS lab 1070 degree of difficulty i've given is 70. it's somewhat difficult 65 is average so if you are good with cli probably it's easy for you but if you're new to it uh, it may take a little bit of learning and once again objective is to create s3 buckets we're not just going to create we'll also copy files and we're going to delete the buckets we're going to remove files and try to delete the buckets and force delete let's see what are some of the high level steps for it we're going to log in um, to aws cli so therefore we must have it installed if you need help with installation on uh, mac os uh, look up this lab id and for windows look up this lab id get yourself set up it's pretty straightforward to get it uh, install on your uh, either windows or mac uh, it's uh, um, it's not very difficult at all once you provide the credentials after you install it then you're good to go then you'll be at this point i have done this on mac os so you can follow along if you have mac if windows same thing just look up that that lab that i just mentioned here and that should walk you through to get to this point in windows okay so we'll do ls this is just like a regular linux ls but you prepare aws and then s3 so we are listing the buckets make bucket is mb and you give fully qualified global name so s3 colon slash slash a globally unique name so i've given some guidelines here how to make it global just come up with some maybe your initial and then four random number so that it becomes unique for everyone once you create that bucket make sure you see that create another bucket so i'm creating one private and one public and we will list it again so we should see those two buckets at this point i'm going to then copy some files to both of these buckets so let's let's look at that okay so here I am copying some files, uh, one file to this bucket with the cp command, same Linux command, AWS S3, and I'm copying another file to another bucket, and then I'm trying to delete the bucket. The rule is that empty bucket cannot be removed unless you use force, so force attribute at the end of the command line or somewhere in the command line, you need to force remove it. Just like Linux, uh, uh, they have the same situation there. But you can also remove a file. You can use rm command to remove one particular file 
object from the bucket and once it's empty you can use rb command to remove um, or unless if it's not empty then you need to use the force switch certification exam relevance let's look at that s3 is exceedingly important topic for associate level aws certification exams as well as professional level certification exams um, about four to eight questions is what i would expect in associate level certification exams for s3 um, very important topic highly encourage you to do four laps of s3 if you can and process of going through the hands-on labs always always reinforces even though you may not need to do even single lab to pass aws certified architect associate certification for example you can pass without touching it without ever deploying a bucket but this would make it twice as fast and you're going to be more marketable if you need help there are a number of ways to reach out to me just make sure to use one or more of those ways and for further references you can look up uh, or search google with this or for tutorials and documentation make sure to get your free to your access and uh, once you try this hands-on lab uh, either follow along or do it after me um, you should try a couple more of your own so create maybe two different directories things like that that will reinforce it even further okay so let's go back up uh, this is the task we're gonna switch back and forth to this window and uh, we will um, get going with it okay so let me get to the command line uh, so first of all this is uh, let me go and we don't have any we have this bucket KS0318 that I, I use it for my stuff but there's nothing that exists here that we're gonna create okay so AWS configure is how you configure your credentials I have already done so before so I'm just uh, stepping through it if that's your first time you need to put your access key and secret key for an admin user that you created under IAM. So once you have that, you should be able to see AWS S3 LS. So you will see that one bucket we have. And we're gonna create two more buckets. We're gonna say AWS S3, make bucket, S3 colon, HCC, rocks, one, two. So I'm gonna do KS, one, two, three, four, dash, private. So we're gonna create that bucket. I'm gonna see if it created by ls command there it is I'm gonna create a public bucket as well and we're gonna see that if it exists very good in my local directory I'm under AWS documentation so I have files that I can copy up there so copy command uh, s3 CLI is really beautiful very very straightforward just like Linux uh, works very well and it's pretty short AWS S3 is all you prepend to uh, all your commands and then LS for example as we I did earlier CP for copy so I'm copying AWS CLI dot PDF to my uh, it's not right it just copy and paste that's the folder uh, sorry bucket so let's put that CLI in the private folder and it's going up there and how do we see it we can do uh, AWS S3 LS on that bucket and we should see CLI in there AWS S3 LS again will show us three buckets but if you want to see inside the bucket then you append the bucket name and in the public we don't have anything yet okay so let's copy something in public so what we have here copy let me clear it what we have here uh, cop AWS s3 copy AWS overview dot PDF to s3 HCC so if I don't want to type it I'm just going to control you to clear it AWS s3 LS and I'm just gonna copy and paste my bucket name so I don't have to type the long bucket name s3 cp aws overview dot pdf to s3 colon and 
we copy it to the public let's see hcc we copied before to private now we'll copy to public let's do aws s3 ls and this bucket and we should see overview document because i didn't complete that let's see that's an overview and then in the private we have cli okay so that's how you look at it now deleting the bucket so aws s3 ls let's say i want to delete this to private and public bucket delete command delete bucket command is rb remove bucket make bucket is mb remove bucket is um, rb aws s3 it's a very short and sweet commands aws s3 s3 rb and then let's try to remove our public bucket which has overview document and we're gonna fail that because it's not empty it's not empty as you can see the error message so how do we make it empty well that's a unix command rm and we put that um, bucket name and then what was the file name there under the public bucket we have aws overview.pdf so we do paste that and should remove that file and now we can remove the bucket because it's not empty so bucket is gone the public bucket aws s3 ls public is gone private is there we cannot remove the private bucket let's see if we can because it's not empty what's inside aws s3 ls let's see what's inside the private bucket cli file is in there so let's see there are more files let's see um, ls aws s3 copy aws web application firewall i copied to the private as well okay so we look at the aws ls for private now we have two files right so we don't want to remove maybe we have 20 files you want to force delete it so how do we force delete it let me do ls again up here so aws s3 same thing remove bucket and then remove this bucket if it's a long bucket always copy and paste so you don't make a mistake in writing and then force it now let's fail it first so you know it's not gonna work and then we force it and it should be gone it's deleting the files and there's no such bucket aws s3 ls only the bucket i had to begin with so i think we could have watched it here the buckets popping up for example let's say aws3 make bucket s3 just gonna type some characters here and it should create let's see you just refresh it and you should see that and aws s3 remove bucket and we should have remove that it's that simple okay beautiful beautiful cli for s3 there are a lot more you can do you can sync for the directories you can do a lot of things from the command line and it's pretty straightforward aws s3 ls rb mb uh, rm cp sync so on and so forth pretty pretty cool okay so that concludes s3 from the command line for this lab uh, lab id once again hcc dash aws dash lab dash one zero seven zero my name is casey shaw this is uh, hello cloud search aws hands-on lab session thank you very much bye bye question id hcc aws pq one two five zero one two five zero Call up the question, what approach would be quickest in order to get some grasp? Quick scan of the choices, trusted advisor, 
run trusted advisor call trusted advisor hire the best partner and log on to the console let's look at the fact pattern now the company started their cloud journey they have about 1000 servers in the cloud companies plan to deploy 5000 more in the next one year cloud architect who designed this environment does not work there anymore does not work so they have they have a change CISO is worried about security CIO is worried about cost product manager is worried about availability and resiliency so we have five different worries going on here uh, you are brought in as a consultant what approach would be the quickest in order to get a grasp on the current environment in terms of the concerns raised by this team the correct answer is b run trusted advisor that will give you answers in all these areas trusted advisor will give you uh, five checks cost performance fault tolerance i'll say ft security and service limits these five checks immediately so let's see would it satisfy cloud architect okay CISO is worried about security so that's there security here CIO is worried about cost cost is here product manager is worried about availability that would be fault tolerance and resiliency would be also be fault tolerance or it could also be performance and service limits nobody's worried about but trusted advisor will give you these five checks so that should be your answer other choices choice a call your most trusted advisor friend so if you're in hurry you read this and you say yes that's the answer and you'll be wrong so call the trusted advisor is not a friend we are talking about trusted advisor is a tool hire the best AWS partner immediately would that give you very quick insight probably not not the quickest log on to AWS console and go to all services not the quickest either trusted advisor is your answer will be quick in this case and that sh should do it for this question AWS PQ 1250 question ID 8 CC AWS PQ 1366 the call of the question is where I like to start what should the company's cloud architects turn to in order to achieve their stated goal let's scan the options a b c d well architected framework quick start professional services tier one partner the company has decided to embrace cloud computing to start their journey towards the hybrid cloud environment the company wants to build a very large and global sap hana based application on aws and go live in just two weeks two weeks they want to go live building hana However, the company wants to deploy the application with the best practices and proper architecture. They want to do the right thing, but they want to do it very quickly. And they have a very specific use case. What should the company's cloud architects turn to in order to achieve their stated goal above? Well-architected framework, quick start, AWS professional services, or tier one partner, the answer is quick start. In these type of situations where speed is of a sense and very specific use case needs to be deployed, you can look at quick start reference guides. AWS has published tens of such reference deployment documents with actual cloud formation scripts available. So you can simply click on launch and it's going to start launching your environment based on the best practices based on what is working in the field for other customers so AWS's knowledge about it is baked into this quick start reference document so that's the that's the quickest way to do so cloud architect should turn to quick start document let's look at other options well architected framework that's a good idea but it's not going to be quick in two weeks so you should always look at well-architected framework, but in the given situation where we have very specific workload and a short period of time that we need to deploy, quick start is better than that. So we have to pick the best of the answers. It's not the right or the wrong answer in this case. AWS professional service organization, they can also help, but not as quickly as quick start. Maybe they will also turn to the quick start 
themselves. Engage tier one partner probably gonna turn to quick start as well, but it's gonna take a lot longer. Uh, both of C and D may take longer than two weeks to engage, get started and deploy. So engagement do take time you to get into contract uh, terms with the partners with AWS and you have to start working. So it's not practical. So as a cloud architect, you might not want to recommend that. Maybe long-term approach, yes, both of them would work. But short-term, you need to quickly turn to B. Look at the already available quick reference deployment guide. Make modifications based on your requirement, and you should be up and running pretty quickly. So answer choice B is the right answer. Quick start deployment guide in the given situation of SAP HANA. There's very specific deployment guide for SAP HANA. So you should turn to that. And that's the end of question HCC AWS PQ 1366. Thank you. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search, AWS Hands-On Lab. In this session, I'll walk you through EBS Hands-On Lab. EBS stands for Elastic Block Storage. The lab ID for this assignment is hcc-aws-lab-1058. Degree of difficulty is 65, which is right about the average. So if you know this, uh, how to do this, uh, it's right about the average. All right, once again, topic is elastic block storage. The objective of this particular lab is attach an EBS volume to an EC2 instance. We're gonna create an EC2 instance first, and then we're gonna attach an EBS volume. So here are the high level steps, as I always talk about in all my labs, at a very high level, uh, what steps we're gonna take, and we're gonna go in, and uh, I'm gonna go in and demonstrate that to you. And hopefully you can either follow along or do it at your own time. Maybe pause and, and, uh, and play and however you want to consume that information. Log into AWS console. That's the first uh, action we'll take using with an IAM admin user, not the root user. Deploy an EC2 instance. Uh, if you have, you can use the one you have, but in this case, we'll just deploy a new one. Go to EC2 dashboard and then go into EBS section and then we deploy an EBS volume and then in subsequent section we attach the EBS volume to the Linux EC2 instance. So those are the steps at a very high level that we need to take. Once we mount the volume, we're going to copy a file to it by getting the homepage of aws.amazon.com and we'll store it into this new EBS volume that we created. Now, why do you need an EBS volume? EBS volume is a block storage device. There's a whole section on uh, on the exam notes as well as the uh, summary section. So there are two videos for pretty much all the all these sections. So a lot more information there, but in a very brief uh, summary, I would say that elastic block storage is, you know, you can either boot from it, a lot of, uh, Amazon, AWS, AMIs boot off of an EBS-based volume. Or you can add it as an additional block storage. Um, one EBS volume can only be attached to one EC2 instance at a time. Although an EC2 instance can attach multiple EBS, in, EBS volumes, but one volume can be attached to only one EC2 instance. And you store the file. So and those files will stay even though server is terminated or stopped the EBS is persistent um, if you boot off of EBS that could or could not be persistent depending upon the choice you make uh, upon the termination of EC2 but the additional EC2 volume is going to be persistent you will have to manually delete it for it to disappear so you can save the data and then images can come up and go and then they can consume this or mount this volume to the images and then consume the data so that's the use case for it AWS certification Relevance for EBS, a very important topic, especially important for associate level, uh, CCP, that is Cloud Certified Professional for AWS, as well as uh, Associate Architect and CSOP. Those certifications are heavy on uh, 
usage of EBS and I strongly encourage you to master the concept. Three to six questions is what I would expect in uh, associate level exam. Highly encourage you to do at least two labs, if not more. And it's always very important to go through hands-on labs, though you can perhaps um, and definitely pass EBS and associate level exams without touching AWS console or EBS, deploying EBS, but you're going to learn twice as fast. It's going to be more relevant, more useful, and more effective for you, for your career. So go through these exercises. They're not really rocket science. You can do it. All right, so if you need any help, there are a number of ways you can reach out to me. And here are some of the ways identified. Uh, you can email, you can uh, participate in free discussion boards, blog posts, Facebook, and other means. References for this particular section um, or topic, EBS Tutorials, uh, AWS, with the site colon, will get you directly to the tutorial where you can do hands-on, uh, step-by-step and then the documentation site. Um, and if you haven't gotten the free tier access, make sure to do so. And then, you know, based on this lab, you can create scenario two of your own. That would not be a bad idea. Okay, so uh, with that said, let's go over to the, uh, we are going to jump to the AWS console. Let me start from the login. So I'm going to log in as an IAM user to my IAM link, EC2, and we are going to launch a new instance, AMI, and then review and launch straight away. We're going to launch the instance. We're going to use the key I already have, launch the instance. Once instant launches, we're going to SSH into it. So let's give it... 30 seconds or so, we already have the IP address, so we'll prep it. IP address is there for this new instance. Control C, Command C, I'm on a Mac. And while it's coming up, let's name it SRV03. So I have one and two, which are terminated, but still there for some time. It's going to show there, and then it's going to pop away. By the way, if you don't want to see terminated instances, you can you can do some filtering here. So instant state only running. Show me only running instances. Um, so it wouldn't show, it would only show the currently running. So number three is the one we just deployed. Let's copy the IP address either from there or you can, you see it down here. Um, you can customize these columns, which I have done so. And once you have that, we're going to jump onto my terminal on my Mac. You can do it from Windows just as well. Look up some of the Windows uh, getting set up labs and the rest is the same. So let's see, we're going to do SSH, see which directory I'm in, the keys directory. So SSH minus I, EC2 master key is what I used. And then EC2 user at the IP address and we are going to get logged in. We are inside the server now. So the next step the lab calls for is type this command. So we're going to mount, we're going to create a local folder and we're going to mount this new volume. So first we're going to go to this new, we're going to go to, uh, first we created EC2. We're going to go to this uh, EC2 dashboard and create a volume. So we're going to go here. Uh, elastic block storage. So let me show that to you. So this is where EBS, this is EBS, elastic block storage. So volume and snapshots. So we're going to click on the volume, create a new volume. Let's say just one gig, just for training, learning purposes. And Volume type is fine. Rest defaults are fine. I'll just say create the volume created successfully. And that's this new one. Let's say refresh. The new one that is just available, the top one. Let's call it uh, EBS volume 01. Okay. That's the one I just created, um, the EBS volume 01. 
Uh, let me just delete the other ones so they are not oh, they're mounted in use so cannot delete it no worries i'll delete it later so that's the evs volume that we just created it's available meaning it's not mounted anywhere so we can mount it we can say attach volume and we can attach it to server that we want to so this is srv 100 that's running uh, so you don't see our server and the reason for that is this volume and server are in not the same availability zone. availability zone that's the requirement so let's look at that so that's our volume let's go to the instances the new instance we created SRV03 and that's in availability zone 2B US West 2B Whereas the volume we created is in US West 2A. So they are not in the same availability zone. So you cannot mount it. You cannot change this one either. So we need to create a new one. We just delete that and we refresh it and it's gone. Create a new volume, one gig. Here is uh, the availability zone. We're gonna create in the same availability zone as our server 03 and then we create it and we name it don't have to name it this is just so we identify EBS volume 01 and we let's try to attach it now it's still building so oh that's not the one This is the one we just built, EBS volume 01, and that's available to be mounted. We say attach, and we click on the instance, and we should see our new instance that we launched, server 03. STF by default, that's the first one, slash dev STF. We keep that as default, we say attach. So now that volume is attached, doesn't mean you can start using that linux has to recognize that as well so once it is fully attached let's see it says in use uh, refresh it and it's in use and it's all good to go the ebs volume one is in use so now now let's go to our instance we logged into okay so we'd say ssh minus i ec2 master key and then ec2 user at let's find out the ip address of the instance which was srv03 and this is the ip address and we put it here and we log in okay so we are logged in now we do those commands df minus h df minus h to see the partition the current mount points and we don't have the one we created we're gonna mount it there so we are getting ready for that so we'll do sudo mkfs minus t external 3 slash dev slash stf that's the mount point uh, the raw volume is there slash dev slash sdf and we're going to mount it with external three type file system so we're creating a file system so file system created and we are going to create a local directory you can create it anywhere i'm going to create under mnt so you say you sudo make directory slash mnt bs volume that directory doesn't exist so just just check it let's see um ls slash mnt is nothing there so we're gonna create that directory that's just local directory now we're gonna mount that abs volume in that local directory by this command mount nfs mount so now we will do mount with a sudo so with the root slash dev slash stf to that directory Okay, so we can just simply go MNT, EBS, volume, there's nothing there. We can copy either with a CP command or we can just do wget. 
sudo wget http aws.amazon.com now we have that index.html file in there you can wget um, something else say http google.com it's going to create another index file there too so index uh, permission denied, so we had to do sudo control a sudo and is going to have another index HTML one that's from Google. This is from AWS, so on and so forth. You can also say co copy etc host to here sudo copy etc host here, and then you can do ls so you got that file here so it's a full-fledged volume that you can move it to another server just like that you attach it to another server and that server will mount it and you can be moving that around as needed basis so that's pretty much it let's recap what we did um, in this lab we wanted to uh, we logged in as a non-root user, IAM user. We created an EC2 instance and we created an EBS volume uh, of one gig and we mounted that volume to the new Linux server that we built. Uh, we first created file system, we created local directory and we connected the two here. And then we just cd to that directory and use it just like any other directory. But all this, the data is being stored on the EBS volume that you just created, which is actually here, this one, which is on that EBS uh, volume um, that we created in uh, the console. So that's the EBS lab, very straightforward, but you need to know some of these commands, though not for your exam preparation. You can just copy and paste. Uh, you will not be asked such detail, exact command question. That's not the knowledge being tested for the rubric published by AWS for all their exams, but it's good to, to know that or have access to it. So I've given that to you and you can try it and build a couple more EBS and attach it to different servers. Remember, EBS volume you create and the server you create must be in the same availability zone for it to be able to mount it. Otherwise, you cannot. Not same region, same availability zone as well. Okay, So there you have it. That's end of lab HCC AWS lab 1058 for AWS hands-on on EBS for your certification preparation. My name is Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Service. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, let's look at the shared security responsibility model. Question ID HCC AWS PQ1204. You are hired. Let's start with the call of the question, as I always do. Which of the following are the company's responsibility for AWS shared responsibility model? Choose two answers is what we have to do. And I would scan the choices at this point. Compute server side 50%. Edge location security all application data. So I have an idea when I read the question, what is it all about? For more information, look at my exam taking strategies for success. You are hired as a cloud practitioner by the company one week ago. The company is planning to move 100 servers in AWS in next two weeks. Architecture calls for using AWS Cloud Front capability, that's their CTN, involving their edge locations. The CIO of the company is extremely concerned about the security and wants to ensure that the company carries out the security of the of the cloud uh, environment uh, of the cloud environment per the best practices. Which of the following are the company's responsibilities? Company's responsibilities. What under this shared responsibility, shared responsibility security model? So two choices, answers are B and E. Let's look at B, server-side encryption. That is AWS company's responsibility, not AWS, and all application data. So question is asking what is our responsibility, this company's non-AWS. Other options, compute capabilities, that's AWS provides 50% of the application data, other 50% is AWS shared responsibility, not so, 100% of application data is this customer's responsibility. 
edge location security is aws responsibility not the company's responsibility so let's look at these options down here and look at this picture the table what is where who owns what piece in the shared responsibility model customer security in the cloud security of the cloud the question was customer's responsibility which to server side encryption falls under customer responsibility and all application data that's customer data falls under customer obviously and the other options we discarded were down here fall under aws's responsibility so that's it for this question degree of difficulty 70 not so hard if you logically think about it it makes sense but you still have to make sure you study this table fairly well you will have to answer a few questions in uh, certified cloud practitioner exam so make sure you're ready for that if you're taking that exam thank you very much bye bye hello let's talk about question id 8 ccaws pq1266 what of the following are IAM best practices according to AWS? Choose two best practices. There are several. I've listed it down here. So let's look at the answer here. B and D. Grant list privileges the best practice. Rotate security credentials regularly is another best practice for IAM under AWS. So there are several best practices, as I said. Let's look at those down here. Have four five or six of them maybe more right there a bunch of them okay so there are several i would like you to go through those you will have a couple of questions uh, if not more on this subject in uh, certified cloud practitioner as well as associate uh, a solution architect and even developer exam so make sure you understand these best practices and you uh, you know uh, go accordingly also CSOFT, by the way would have this type of questions as well so uh, because it's part of the curriculum part of the rubric um, just uh, double check and i'm pretty sure that i am is part of that anyway so make sure you you master the concept of i am best practices and what are those once again the answers are here b and d b is grant list privilege and rotate security credentials regularly other options why they are incorrect grant maximum privilege quite the opposite grant list privilege to admin users and have them open ticket now that's impractical you need to give them uh, not the least privilege but you know just enough privilege to do the job and uh, you can have them you know uh, elevate those access as needed but you gotta be practical that's least privilege meaning almost no privilege at all choice e restrict use of mfa for only privileged users such as c-level staff no privileged users in terms of iam are ones with rights not with the power or title c-level right so not that kind of privilege we are talking about so the concept in iam the best practice is set up multi-factor authentication for privileged users this privilege users meaning elevated access users users with elevated access not elevated titles such as c-level staff so that's incorrect as well so b and d are the im best practices there's a list down here make sure you go through that that should do it for this question hccawsp pq 1266 kc shah if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me via the communication channels thank you very much bye bye Question ID 8 CCAWS PQ 1164. Let's discuss that. Which of the following AWS services can be penetration tested? Penetration tested by its customers. Not all the AWS services can be penetration tested. It's only few. Choose two is the call of the question. Answer choices A and B, EC2 and Lambda. These are the two. You cannot penetration test Glacier. You cannot penetration uh, test S3 nor IAM. These services are not possible to penetration test. EC2 and Lambda, also not all EC2 instance types. The micro ones are not uh, allowed for penetration testing. But these are two broader categories. So let's look at the explanation here. And there is a list of 
those categories and services. So EC2, RDS, Aurora, CloudFront, API, Gateway, Lambda, LightSail, DNS, Zone, Walking. These are eight services that you can perform penetration testing against. Degree of difficulty 70, just above the average, because you have to remember this. It's not fun to remember things for both. Uh, so that should do it for this question ID once again, H. CC AWS PQ1164. Thank you. Let's talk about this question ID HCC AWS PQ1356. PQ1356. Which of the following is false? False about RDS. Answer is D. It can be deployed in multi region. That is false statement. Therefore, true answer. It can be deployed in multi AZ, not multi region. Remember, multi keyword can get you. Multi AZ is true. Multi region is false. It can be deployed in multi AZ. That is true statement. Therefore, incorrect answer. DB is automatically backed up. That is true statement. Incorrect answer. It's supposed to. It supports Postgres SQL. That is true statement. Therefore, incorrect answer because we are looking for false. And false is it can be deployed in multi-region. No, not as one database. You can do one database in one region, another in other region. That's two different databases. It's not multi-region single database. Multi multi AZ. Yes, multi-region. No. Degree of difficulty, just about average. So that should do it for this question. HCC, AWS PQ, 1356. 1418. Let's start at the call of the question. What should the cloud architect do to solve the problem? Okay, what should cloud architect do? Now, the assumption in this type of call of the question is what should the cloud architect do based on the best practices just remember that just we give this person a title he or she took this test passed it got the certification so it is assumed that person knows the best practices or needs to know the best practices because you are being asked that question in this exam so just keep that in mind subtle thing but important the company is operating hybrid cloud environment for the last two years, supporting 300 applications, 1,000 EC2 instances, 800 on-premises virtual servers. So in other words, it's a good mix of hybrid environment. The company is using RDS for MySQL for their applications. The cloud operator noticed that RDS access is slow and it is affecting users. The cloud watch logs confirm that RDS is busy and near capacity. You go to the cloud architect, what should that person do? What should she do? The answer is B. She should upgrade RDS instance type for better performance out of RDS MySQL. So how you, you start with an instance type, when you roll out an RDS, you make a selection based on your performance requirement, based on the money you want to spend. You make a selection of the instance type, R2, for example. If you want to upgrade that instance because operator has noticed the performance is not good. RDS is busy and near capacity. So CloudWatch logs show that RDS is near capacity. So it needs to be upgraded, in other words. So who makes that decision? Customer. So Cloud Architect needs to upgrade this instance to a better one. And that's the answer, answer B. Answer choice A, migrate RDS to MySQL to MySQL running on EC2 instance. Not true. Keep this in mind in all of your questions it's very likely that this is not the right answer. Anytime you want to run database on an EC2 instance, 9 out of 10 times, perhaps 10 out of 10 times in the exams, practice exams, it's going to be incorrect answer. AWS scales RDS instance type automatically incorrect. Even though it's fully managed, instance type selection is customers, upgrade decision is also customers because it costs extra money. 
RDS instance type does not need to be changed after initial selection by the customer because RDS, RDS is a fully managed service. It is a fully managed service but not as fully managed as DynamoDB because DynamoDB came later so RDS when it came out that was good enough for a fully managed service but now fully managed service is more like DynamoDB where you don't even make instance type selection it automatically scales right so this is more fully managed maybe fully managed version 2 this is fully managed version 1 so that's the difference in RDS you still need to up the instance type a customer needs to so right answer for this cloud architect to do is upgrade the RDS instance go to the console and make that upgrade decision and execute that that should do it degree of difficulty 75 1418 in the history thank you let me talk about this question id 8 ccaws pq 1348 pq 1348 call up the question what would you turn to improve your user's experience quick glance dynamodb accelerator Dynamod replace DynamoDB with Aurora, replace DynamoDB with Oracle, deploy Cassandra on EC2. Most likely in all your AWS exams, adding a database on an EC2 instance would never be an answer. So an Oracle would never be an answer as well. So these two, I can cross it out even before beginning. That's why I like to start with call up the question, glance at the options and then read the fact pattern in the end. Let's read that. You are a solution architect for the company's AWS cloud environment. You, cho you chose DynamoDB, non-relational NoSQL database for that application. Data has grown exponentially over the last two months. Users are complaining. So now it's grown exponentially. Users are now complaining about rising latency. It was all good, but now it's not. You notice that the read has slowed down significantly. What would you do when you know that read is a problem? How would you improve that? Your answer is DynamoDB Accelerator. DAX in short, it's also fully managed service that works with DynamoDB that delivers read acceleration for your DynamoDB database. So you would turn to that. You will not replace DynamoDB with Aurora because your customers uh, you are looking for no sequel i mean you have designed a no sequel environment so you will not change it to sequel or relational database because of read issue uh, never replace with the oracle database there's a big feud going on if you don't know look up all the reinvents from 2015 16 and 17 uh, there will be always one punch from uh, Andy Jesse during the keynote speech at each reinvent about Oracle, about Larry Ellison and so on. And Oracle does uh, the same in reverse, I think, in their show. But it's, uh, it's, it's you know, uh, it, they both don't like each other, let's just say that. So Oracle would never be an answer, safe to say that, in an AWS exam. And probably vice versa too. So, 1348, end of that uh, question. Uh, pretty straightforward. Thank you very much. Let's look at question ID 8CC AWS PQ 1374. Call up the question What should the company's cloud architects turn to in order to achieve their stated goal? Let's glance at the options, well-architected framework, quick start, professional services organization, or tier one partner. Company has decided to embrace cloud computing, start their journey. Company wants to build very large global Tableau server with Redshift and RDS on AWS and go live in just two weeks. However, the company wants to deploy the application with the best practices. They want to do the right thing and proper architecture without any compromise what the company architect should turn to so time is of a sense the answer is b quick start reference guide aws has published purpose-built quick start reference deployment guides that there's one for tableau server with redshift and rds as well these guides are purpose-built to the exact 
workload, in this case Tableau with Redshift and RDS, they provide cloud formation script for the workload that it, you can simply click on it to get started with the deployment process. The best thing to do is you have two weeks, the architect should look at this uh, deployment reference, uh, quick, quick start reference deployment guides, understand them, modify to their requirements and get going very quickly. Let's look at the other options. Well architected framework, very useful. They should always look at it, but it's not going to be sufficient or uh, it, they won't be able to pull it off within two weeks, right? So it is not right suggestion with the given set of stated goals and the requirements we have. AWS Professional Services, very good option as well, but it's going to take longer than Quick Start. They may turn to Quick Start as well. Engage AWS Tier 1 partner, that's also a very good option, but not in this case because it will take longer. Both of, both options C and D may take a little longer to get into contracts and other aspects. So correct answer is B, Quick Start Reference Deployment is the way to go in this situation because it's a very large organization, has Tableau server with Redshift and RDS and requires to be up and running in two weeks, do not want to compromise on architecture. So best thing to do is turn to ready-made deployment guide available from AWS that's already vetted, tested multiple times by AWS and by their customers. Use that and deploy that workload with it. So that's end of question. It's ECAWS PQ 1374. Thank you. Question ID 8 CC AWS PQ 1206. 1206. Question is the call of the question. That's where I like to start. Which of the following areas should not be on the company's list to secure? So it's a negative question. What should not be companies? Meaning what should be AWS responsibility? We have a bunch of choices. In this case, I'm not going to even glance them because I would like to just read the question and figure it out uh, based on the choices in this case. You have to be a little smart about it. Read and listen to my exam strategy, exam success strategy document and a video. For more information, the company wants to move to AWS Cloud from their own premises and by hosting 3,000 applications worldwide. You're working closely with AWS account team. CISO of the company is concerned about security of AWS. Which of the following areas should not be? So should be AWS responsibility, should not be company's responsibility in their list. Choose two, answer C and D. Edge locations and storage services, regions and database services. These are AWS responsibilities, not the company's responsibilities. Let's look at other options. Network config is company's responsibility, whereas this is AWS. So A, C, so that both are jointly not correct. Edge locations is AWS, application data is company, jointly incorrect. Regions and operating system patching for instances region is AWS, OS patching is company, jointly incorrect. Here both are AWS, AWS, AWS and AWS. So these two are correct choices. Let's look at this table down here and that has the answers to our choices. So edge locations and storage services, do they have orange marker? Let's see, edge locations and storage services. Okay, so that's part of their responsibilities. And regions and operating system, uh, sorry, C and D, regions and database services. So let's look at regions and database services. So these four are part of AWS. And as I mentioned, others are mixed, either AWS or uh, customer responsibility, but not both. So you have to be careful in reading the question. That's why degree of difficulty, I put it slightly higher to above average, which is 70. 65 is my average. Look at the calibration thermometer for more information on how I calibrate these questions so you understand where you stand. 
Okay, that should do it for this question. HCCAWSPQ1206. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any question, any time during your studies, any day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Question ID 8 CCAWS PQ 1284. The question is, what is the meaning of the effect statement in an IAM policy? Effect statement is, it does specify allow or deny action. So what's the effect of this policy stanza or policy segment? in this document. So it's whether allow or deny. What is the effect of that? It's pretty straightforward. It, the other option specifies what resource is affected. No, that's the resource section. Uh, specifies which principles access is affected. That's principal section. Specifies what condition must be matched. That's condition section. So it uh, effect statement allow, uh, specifies what is allowed or denied by that statement. So very straightforward, uh, degree of difficulty 65. Uh, exam question ID 1, sorry, 8CC, AWSPQ, 1284. That's the end of it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Let's talk about this question. HCC, AWSPQ, 1222-1222. Which of the following is the company's responsibility under shared responsibility model? Quickly glance at these choices. Protect parameter, protect parameter, protect only on premise, protect only on premise. So that's what I'm looking for. A company is operating hybrid cloud environment, 90% servers in AWS, 10% servers in on-premises. Company is running an antivirus and DLP software. Company has established direct peering connectivity between their main data center and AWS by using Meet Me service from Equinix. Which of the following is the company's responsibility? Company's responsibility under shared model a. Protect the perimeter and host in on-premise data center. You need to protect those, right? So you're running hybrid environment. This is the company. This is AWS. You need to protect your perimeter here. There is a direct connect between these two. And you need to protect physically this perimeter. And if you have an internet connection, which most companies do, you need to protect this logically as well. Other options, protect the parameter and host in AWS. You don't need to do that. Parameter in AWS, protect only on-premises host and not on-premises parameter. You need to pr protect both. Protect only on-premises perimeter and not host because there is a direct connect in place between the company. Not so. You still need to protect regardless of direct connect because traffic can come in straight from the internet. So that's the answer, A, protect the perimeter and host in on-premise data center. That is for shared responsibility model. You will see the table down here when you browse through. It's a pretty straightforward question, and that should do it for HCCAWSPQ1222. Thank you very much. Question ID HCCAWSPQ1416. What is true about relational database service? Answer is A, RDS instant type choice is made by the customer. So who decides? The customer decides what instant type they want to run their RDS. Even though it's a fully managed service, there are several instant types offered by AWS. Obviously different pricing model for each one of those instance types, not as many as EC2 instance types, but there are several that customer needs to choose based on the performance they want out of their relational database service running in AWS. Once they make that choice, RDS is deployed on that type of a hardware, that type of EC2 instance on the back end. You don't have access to it, but that they use that based on your choice and based on the amount of money you want to pay for that and based on your requirements. Other incorrect options, RDS instance type choice is made by AWS, incorrect. Customer makes that choice. AWS scales RDS instance type automatically. So if you start here, say a smaller instance, you want to grow to a larger one, who makes that call? Customer decides. AWS does not. 
RDS instance type does not need to be changed after initial selection. We said initial selection is done by the customer. Does it need to be changed by the customer? So this choice is saying RDS instance type does not need to be changed after initial selection because RDS is a fully managed service. Is that true? That's incorrect. Change of instance type is required sometimes based on the performance or lack thereof and the customer needs to make that call. It's not automatically scaled. In DynamoDB it is, but not in relational database. In DynamoDB, customer does not make that choice. It automatically scales in the back end. You don't even know what systems, what servers it's running on. It just scales auto magically. But in RDS case, customer needs to make that selection. So that's incorrect. The correct answer is A. What is true? RDS instance type choice is made by the customer. And even updates, upgrades to that, this arrow here, is also made by the customer, not automatically. So 14, 16, end of it. Let's talk about this question ID HCC AWS PQ 1334. 1334. Call of the question. What would you recommend that CISO turn to? Quick scan of the choices, tech support, tier one partner, trusted advisor, solution architect. Question. The company has decided to embrace cloud computing and start their journey towards the hybrid cloud environment. The company migrated 50% of their 800 on-premises applications to AWS over the last 12 months. CISO wants to take stock of the environment and wants to gauge the current security posture as deployed for a meeting with the CEO in an hour. Okay, some objectives here or extra information. Make sure that you digest that and you answer based on that requirement or those kind of keywords. So they have a sizable environment here. CISO wants to take stock of the current environment and wants to gauge the current security posture as it is deployed for a meeting with CEO in an hour. What would you recommend that CISO turn to? What would you say? Hey CISO, what would you do? Trusted advisor. Give CISO access to trusted advisor tool or run it for the CISO provide information. Other options? AWS tech support will take you longer. They, they'll not do that unless you have enterprise kind of a support, and that too, it would not be done in an hour. Uh, tier one partner, same thing. And solution architect, um, you can turn to, they can help you. But in a paid engagement in professional services environment, they can go into that details. Or even if you have enterprise support, they can do to some degree, not to the extent you might want, but to some degree they can help you. But definitely in paid engagement they can do it, so, uh, but not in an hour. So those options would not be good. AWS Trusted Advisor, you can get it almost instantaneously. It'll compare your current environment as deployed against the best practices. And then CISO can digest that, say, hey, our security posture is very good, or we need to work on it, and we are working on it in the meeting in an hour. So that would be the best option for you to recommend, AWS Trusted Advisor Tool. The TA tool gives you check in five areas, cost, performance, fault tolerance, security, and service limits. That should be it for this question, AWS PQ 1334. Question ID, HCC AWS PQ 1410. What is false? We're looking for an incorrect statement about I am inline policy. What is an inline policy? Inline policy is one that is applied directly to an entity. So what is false about it? That's not directly applied would be the false. So A, it can be applied to an IAM user via group. That's not in line. That is a policy inherited via the group. So in line is directly applied. So this is a false statement in line policy. This is not an in line policy. So a false statement, therefore correct answer. It can be applied directly to a user. That's the meaning of in line. So correct statement, therefore incorrect answer. 
it can be applied to a group correct statement incorrect answer can be applied to a role correct statement incorrect answer degree of difficulty right above uh, just above average at 70 so that's end of question pq1410 thank you hello let's discuss this question id hccws pq1174 1174 I'd like to start with call of the question based on the above which of the following is true per AWS policy is what we are looking for scan the answers answer choices you must be notified AWS must be notified notified no no need to notify company did not complete something like that and then I'm gonna start my fact pattern this is my strategy for exam success there's a document and a video for that the company wants to perform penetration testing of their AWS environment for internal auditing purposes. The company submitted the request for pen testing on February 10, 2017, asking to start testing on February 22nd. So dates might be important. February 10, February 22nd is that start date. The company received the approval from AWS on February 20th. That's the date of approval. And companies started their testing on February 22nd, 2017. As they mentioned they would, they started on that day. Based on the above, which of the following is true about AWS policy? The correct answer is C. No need to notify AWS upon the completion of penetration testing. So when you complete it, you don't need to, after May 22nd, you don't, don't have one week to notify them. Hey, I'm done. Here is a report. Nothing like that. There's no need to. Other choices, AWS must be notified, no. Must be notified, no. A company did not complete pen testing in allowed time. What is allowed time is 90 days between the start and the end date. Did they complete in 90 days? Let's see. February 22nd to May 22nd, right? So is that 90 days? Yes, that's three months, 90 days. So that they did complete within the allocated time. So that's not a problem. They did not violate. Did not complete. They did complete. So that's incorrect. Answer choice C. No need to notify. No need to notify. Okay. That should do it. Thank you very much. Question 1108. Which of the following is a minimum AWS support that gives you 7 by 24 customer service, not technical support? Business hour technical support, two contacts to open the ticket, and offers less than 15 minute response when business critical system is down. 15 minute response when business critical system is down is aggressive, and that would be the highest cost you would pay for it, would be enterprise. Degree of difficulty 70. Below you will see the table that will walk you through all four levels and what's included where this is the difference the first this one is in basic then let's see business hour technical is in developer minimum developer two people uh, two customer contact is in business and then this one you did minimum of enterprise so there you have it for this question 1108 hello let's talk about this question h c c a w s p q one two one eight one two one eight one two one eight let me draw it just making fun okay one two one eight the question is which of the following is the company's responsibility under the security model so we're looking for company's responsibility company is embarking upon the cloud journey one of the applications that will be deployed will benefit greatly from CDN content delivery network. However, CIO is extremely concerned about the security of the cloud environment. You are hired and your job to find out which one of the following is your responsibility. Okay, so which one is it? D, fault tolerance of the application. You are in charge of your application. You need to design. AWS gives you tools, AWS has laid out regions, AZs, CDN location, edge locations. So you need to plan your application. You need to architect based on the best practice. You can get the guidance, but it's you who will be responsible in the end 
for the fault tolerance. Nothing is going to be 100% fault tolerance, but you can come pretty close to it. But that's always about trading the cost and fault tolerance and other performance aspect of your application. You have to trade one for the other. Near 100% available application will cost a lots and lots of money not even possible but close to 100 percent is possible fault tolerance of a region is aws's responsibility securing cdn locations is aws responsibility securing ec2 virtualization software the one that's running on the hypervisor the host where ec2 instance is running on that is responsibility of aws not yours let's look at this table down here and that's where this question is coming from so because security in the cloud the edge locations right there that's the responsibility of aws and the rest let's see the question again d fault tolerance of the application the so cdn location fault tolerance of a region and virtualization so they are the one who will provide you virtualization happens here and all the zoning and everything is provided here. So oh, this is security of the cloud AWS. The question is asking about what is your responsibility is to deploy application in a fault tolerant manner, take advantage of all these features and capabilities. That should do it for this question. Question ID HCC AWS PQ1218. Thank you very much. This is Casey Shaw. If you have any question, do not hesitate to reach out to me anytime, any place. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay, let's talk about this question ID 8 CCAWS PQ1286. Which of the following is a required or mandatory field in an IAM policy document? The answer is resource or not a resource. It's mandatory. Generally, you have to specify resource, but if it's not, at least you have to say it's not a resource. In other cases, you don't have to mention it at all. So this is one required element of a JSON policy document that can be attached to an IAM user or a role um, in the IAM policies. So what are the other options? Condition, not so. It is optional, principal optional, string like is an optional. Only resource or not a resource is the element that is required in an IAM policy. So let's look at this below that's an effect resource is required one of the section here this resource block is necessary okay so that should do it for this question id 1286 thank you very much bye bye all right let's examine this question together hcc aws pq 1346 1346 Call up the question, what would you recommend to the application architect? Glance at options, RDS, DynamoDB, Aurora, Oracle. Just know that Oracle would never be an answer on any AWS exam. They'll always be a distractor, so let's cross it out first. Just kidding, but that's mostly true. The company has decided to embrace cloud computing and start their journey towards the hybrid cloud environment. The application architect wants to utilize a database that can scale automatically. So we'll highlight that, scale automatically up to 10 terabyte, delivers less than 10 milliseconds of access to the data, requires no or minimal database administration, and she does not have to worry about schema when she wakes up every morning. She doesn't want to be bothered by schema, so schema less, no schema. No schema is what she wants. What would you recommend to her? Your answer is DynamoDB. This spells out DynamoDB, what it can do. If it was a Jeopardy, this was an answer. DynamoDB would be the answer to this question. So uh, DynamoDB is highly scalable, fully managed, no SQL database, delivering less than 10 milliseconds of access or low latency access to the data, requires no database administration on your part, and it does not have any schema because it's no SQL non-relational database. So that's your answer. Uh, other choices, SQL Server on RDS does not deliver all those things. Aurora 
is a relational database. She wants non-relational database somewhere there's no SQL. And then Oracle would never be an answer, would not be able to deliver all those things in the cloud. There is an RDS for um, Oracle option, but that's a relational database. We're looking for non-relational database in this situation. So that should do it. Degree of difficulty right at the average. That's end of 1346. Thank you very much. Question ID 8CCAWSPQ1142. Call up the question, what tool would you be using? Quick scan, scan tool, advise, trusted advisory tool, AZ tool, EC2 dashboard. Okay, so we know what we're looking for. Question, an enterprise company runs a hybrid cloud environment with a 50% servers on premises and 50% in the cloud, AWS cloud. The company is worried about resiliency. Worried about resiliency of their environment. They hired you as a consultant to quickly identify resiliency status of their AWS environment. What tool would you turn to? What would you use? The answer for you would be run the trusted advisor tool check. Trusted Advisor tool check will give you this fault tolerance and that relates to resiliency, whether you can withstand an outage in one of the availability zone at AWS, whether you can withstand an outage of a server, multiple servers, what level of fault tolerance your application is designed upon and running upon. So you can quickly get an idea based on current as a state and compare it to the best practices that AWS has identified and documented in well-architected framework and hundreds of their customers have implemented it. So you they apply that to find out and let you know almost instantaneously because they have all this data. Other options run region scan tool. It's no such tool. Run the AZ scan tool, no such tool. Go to EC2 dashboard and click on resiliency report. No such thing. So only correct answer is trusted advisor tool check. That will give you what you're looking for quickly as well, very quickly. That should do it for this question, AWSPQ1142. Thank you. Let's look at HCC AWSPQ1252. The startup uses AWS cloud computing for their business and productivity applications. The startup had basic support plan initially, which they upgraded to developer support plan last month. What would be one reason for them to upgrade their developer level support plan to business? So they went from basic to developer. What would be one more reason for them to upgrade again from developer to business level support plan? So let's see, the answer is C they will be able to run trusted advisor checks. So if trusted advisor means something to them, they can run all five checks. So basic checks, core checks, security, and service limits are available for all, basic, developer, business, and enterprise. But the cost, performance, and fault tolerance, trusted advisor checks, the three other checks, uh, for tolerance, these are available only from business and enterprise support plan customers. So it is if they can upgrade to business and get all five checks if it means something to them. So that's the answer. Uh, let's look at other options. No difference in trusted advisor capability with this chain. Now there are differences. The table is down here. Uh, in the, on this page. They'll be able to run trusted advisor checks in one more area, no, three more areas. They'll be, they will receive concierge support, no. Concierge support requires enterprise level support agreement, not the business level support. Enterprise support agreement will be required for concierge level support. Degree of difficulty for this question, 65. It's right at the average, 65, 70. 65 is average, 70 is just about above the average. So you'll have to remember some of this. Uh, the table is down here. Let me go there. 
right here so some of this you will have to remember just do all my practice questions and i cover most of the important ones um, that makes sense so that should do it for this question two two sorry one two five two one two five two that's it thank you let's look at this question id one four two six Start at the call of the question. Security expert needs to secure RDS and wants to know which of the following is true. Quick glance about VPC, EC2. Okay, got an idea. Let's read the question. The company has decided to embrace cloud computing and start their journey towards the hybrid cloud environment. DBA wants to leverage RDS. The security expert needs to secure RDS and wants to know which of the following is true. From security perspective the answer is b is true rds can be deployed in a vpc and security groups NACL can be used to protect rds because that's part of a vpc so it can be used so that's the answer other incorrect choices rds cannot be deployed in vpc is incorrect rds can be deployed rds can be installed on an ec2 instance no rds is a service cannot be installed on EC2 instance. RDS cannot be installed on EC2 instance. That's correct. And security groups can be used to protect RDS instance. Now, not on EC2 instance. It can be used. Security groups can be used in a VPC environment. So it doesn't talk about VPC. So therefore, incorrect choice. Correct answer is B. RDS can be deployed in a VPC. Because it can be deployed in a VPC, now we can use security group and NACO. Here, it was no mention of VPC. So by default, it is outside of VPC and you cannot use NACO and security groups. So that's the difference there. Answer is B for 1426. Hello, let's talk about this question HCC AWS PQ1220. The call of the question, which of the following is company's responsibilities? And we have a bunch of options. And I'll just quickly glance at it. Perimeter, perimeter, network switches, and host. Okay, let's look at the fact pattern. The company is operating a hybrid cloud IT environment, servicing their business around the US with 10% servers in AWS, only 10%. In AWS, 90% on-premises. The company is running an antivirus and DLP, digital loss prevention software, in their on-premises data center. On-premises data center. Which of the following is the company's responsibility under the shared responsibility model? The answer is C. Protect the perimeter of their data center, on-premise data center, physically, and from information security perspective, remember these, they are running hybrid cloud. So this is company's data center. This is AWS environment. And they're running a hybrid. So that's it, this is the internet. They are running a hybrid environment. Perhaps they have a direct connect, cross or a VPN connectivity between the DC and AWS. 10% here, 90% over there. And what the question is asking, what is customers, the company's responsibility? Of course, their data center, physical security, uh, guarding the building, and information, whatever is coming in, because they are connected here. Whatever comes in through the data center can affect AWS environment as well. So that is customer. Let's look at other options, uh, which are not correct, and why. A, choice A, protect the host where EC2 instance is run on with the antivirus software just as the on-premises environment. Do you have to do that? Protect the host where EC2 instance is run on with antivirus. That's not necessary. Protect the perimeter of their data center and AWS physically. So perimeter of data center and AWS. The, the customer is not responsible for AWS perimeter. Let's say these are the multiple buildings of AWS. That's the perimeter. You don't even know where this building exists, so you cannot go there. So that's incorrect. D, protect network switches from uh, software in AWS. That is AWS responsibility, not the customers. So customers need to worry about this edge at the data center physically, as well as, so this would be the logical edge, uh, information edge traffic coming in from the internet so they need to protect this 
as well as this, the physical perimeter. So that's the answer, answer choice C for this question about the shared security, shared responsibility security model. Let's look at that model if it's here, right there. So you see that it's based on this. Make sure you understand that well. Lots of questions in certified cloud practitioner exam. That should do it for this question. It's a CAWS PQ1220. If you have any question, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Question ID 8 CCAWS PQ1408. Call up the question, what should the architect do from the following options? Quick scan, I am user, attach S3 write, I am user, secret keys, and a row. Okay, got some ideas about what the question is all about. Fact pattern, company has decided to embrace cloud computing and start their journey towards a hybrid cloud environment. The architect needs to design access from EC2 instances running application to access S3 buckets to write the data. So use cases EC2 instances having access to S3 buckets. Anytime you have that situation, one AWS resource need access to another, just remember this role is very likely to be your answer. So the answer is going to be D, create a role, attach the policy, attach this role to EC2 instance, right? Role gets attached to an instance. So that should do it in the, that's the right answer for D. Let's look at the incorrect answers. Create an IAM user, attach role permitting S3 write access to the user, attach IAM user to instance. Though you don't attach IAM user to instance, you don't attach role to an IAM user, except if it's an Active Directory external user. So that's incorrect. Create an IAM user and add this user to a group, attach a role permitting S3 write access to the group, attach IAM user to EC2 instance. Again, incorrect. You cannot attach IAM users to EC2 instances. Store access and secret keys. Now this is a viable option for an IAM user on EC2 and use these keys. Now it's implied here that IAM user has this access to these buckets, but assume that it, it does. This is this might work, this will work, but it's not the best practice. Remember, you're answering based on the best practice. Storing keys on EC2 instance, not a good idea. So you should not use that approach. So your correct answer is create a role, give that role a policy, and attach it to an EC2 instance. That should do it for this question. Degree of difficulty at about average. 65 is average, 70 is above average. Majority of your questions will be in this. Now look at the thermometer document, thermometer video for how I calibrate my practice questions to give you an idea. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Let's look at this question 1320. When the admin sees the bill, for the server, what should the compute time, what should she expect? We got some numbers here. Let's read the question. EC2 instance server 01 running for three days. So three days in the running state. Infected one of the systems, admin decided to down the server. So it was down, was restarted after, so it was stopped for this long so then six hours 16 minutes 28 seconds that was a stop period and ran for two more days and terminated so you terminated in the end suppose you start here and you terminated there this is a stop okay what should be the compute charges for this server answer is five days answer is five days because you stopped it for this long in the middle and it 
it was terminated at the end so you should expect five days worth of charge now remember this here windows keyword windows ec2 instance does that make a difference yes windows ec2 instance is charged on a per hour basis linux on the other hand is charged on a per second basis but here either instance will not be charged when you stop it right so if this is a stop either instance will stop accruing the charges so in either case it would be five days but if it was not stopped here then it e linux instance would be charged based on a per second whereas windows would be charged on a per hour on a rounded number of hours not not really rounded but rounded to the next hour even if you run for one minute or a half minute it'll be charged a full hour price so that's the answer answer a five days for this windows instance 1320 hello casey shah from hello cloud sets in this video i'll talk about my offer for one-on-one -on -one free guidance to my active udemy learners who is an active udemy learner active udemy learner in my definition is one who posts five times in a q a section of udemy or any other combination thereof on any five different channels listed in my communication channel right so you can post all five questions here or answer five times or ask questions five times or uh, ask for clarification five times or you know uh, help others five times whatever that may be or you can post three questions here and two on the facebook page or you know tweet a couple of times whatever combination once again you have to be just an active learner once you are an active learner you have earned one hour of free one-on-one -on -one guidance from me what are the use cases for this some of the use cases that i have thought through right for example number one if you're doing a hands-on lab and you're stuck you cannot move forward you looked up uh, you looked around on the internet you cannot find an answer you looked at my solution or you're trying something different than what my question and solution is that's fine totally acceptable encouraged in fact in all my labs so you're stuck and you know that's a good use case you know you can call a friend call me call a uh, casey call the instructor and we can get online we can share the screen we can talk on the phone and we can resolve the problem and get you move forward another use case i have thought about is you just need motivation you just want to move forward you're stuck you're not motivated you need some inspiration well phone a friend in casey i'll be there for you let's talk it over i'll get you energized to move forward you know a lot of people are making a lot of money by becoming cloud certified if you get cloud certified especially multiple cloud certifications you are going to design your own compensation package for the next few years i guarantee it so get on board i'll motivate you number three if you're taking an exam for example uh, so your exam is actual exam is next week and i want to make sure or you want to make sure that you are ready for taking this test you're adequately prepared to pass it you know you can, we can get on the call we can get on a, a shared web session on zoom and i'll quiz you i'll you know, test you uh, make sure that you're ready for this exam right so that's another use case and again you know these are some of the use cases i have thought there is no uh, real limitation as far as you're making progress towards achieving the outcomes that you have signed up for i am here for you i'm fully vested why am i doing it well as i mentioned in my introduction this is a passion for me uh, i am not doing it just for the money the day i start doing this just for the money i probably will stop doing this uh, you know honestly this is uh, this offer is far more than any amount of money you have paid for this course i know for a fact right so i charge maybe 300 dollars an hour on an average for my consulting fees uh, in many cases and i'm sure you have paid way less than that for this particular course so uh, it is a huge value uh, the reason i'm mentioning the numbers is i want you to take advantage of this offer right this is very unique offer 
Uh, I don't know any other instructor on Udemy offers such, um, you know, uh, has such an offer. Um, so I would like you to take advantage of that for your benefit. You know, like I said, I've been saying it in this course and all my courses. Let's succeed together, right? We are in it together. I want you to be successful. It's my passion and I want to learn more out of this and create more courses and more material for, you know, other learners from this experience. I want to make sure that I'm there for you. So take advantage of this very unique, very generous offer. You know, it's like a phone a friend when you're stuck. One hour of free guidance. You can break this down, by the way. It doesn't have to be one full hour. You can break it down in two 30-minute session. There's a PDF document attached to this uh, lecture as well as in the resources section. Make sure to download that to get more detailed information about how this works, how to schedule, and the logistics behind it. Really happy to offer this to all my active Udemy learners. I look forward to see you and let's collaborate. Thank you very much. Casey Shah. Bye-bye. Hello, Casey Shah here. In this segment, I'll talk about communication channels available to you. It is extremely important that you communicate with me and other fellow learners. The learners who collaborate are more likely to learn quickly and more efficiently. So you want to be one of those collaborators, one of those learner who communicates, right? So become active learner, right? Remember, there's a benefit to be an active learner in my course. The benefit is all active learners get one hour of free guidance from me if you are active learners. So collaborate. How do you collaborate? I put together a document for you. You can download it in this lecture as well as it's in the resources section of this course. So please go through that document. There are about dozen different communication channels that you have it open or available to you. The easiest one on Udemy to use would be the Q&A forum here inside the course. Within every lecture, you will see a Q&A link. You can click on that to ask questions. So what I recommend is not only you should ask questions, but also you should answer other students questions now there's no wrong answer this is all collaboration this is we all are in it together remember that we are working towards the same goal all learners are in similar boat keep that in mind so don't be shy asking questions don't think that anyone is going to bombard you i'll be moderating the conversation i'll be answering i'll be also posting some questions uh, to increase the collaboration make sure you participate in those collaboration efforts right so the best thing to do is add a question or answer a question on Udemy Q&A section. What are the other options available to you? Uh, not preferred, but you can send me a private message. I don't recommend that for technical support because others may have the same question that you do, and it's hard for me to post that one as an instructor in the Q&A forum. So all the technical questions ask in the Q&A inside the course, but if you have other questions, suggestions, by all means, send me a private message. Uh, other options are go to my website. I have listed it in communication channel. There is a YouTube channel that I post a lot of videos there as well. Uh, then I have a Facebook page, Twitter handle, uh, Slack channel, number of other options that you have. Discussion forum. Uh, one thing I would recommend all of you to sign up for discussion forum. It's free. You can uh, not only get uh, good insight into what others are going through, but also you're going to find a lot of good information there. Sometimes I post information on the discussion forum that might be useful to you. Now, keep in mind that it's going to be that one question or one concept that you knew or that you came to know from one of these discussion or one of these collaboration efforts that's going to make a difference that is very likely to make a difference between past and not past. Now, I have taken, I've said it before, I've taken over 100 certification exams. I can tell you that many, many times it has come down to that one piece of information that I saw somewhere and either it helped me answer the question correctly or more often than not, it helped me eliminate you know, I was down to two choices and helped me eliminate one of those because I knew that information, right? So it's going to be one of those things that is going to help you. It cannot hurt you. It will only help you. It will increase your chances of passing. Collaborate, communicate with me, other fellow learners. You have about a dozen channels. The most important one on Udemy is to, again, ask a question, 
answer a question, comment, anything you can do to engage in learning, engage in collaboration. It's likely to help you. So get on board. I look forward to see your question and answer your questions as well as see your answers to others' questions as well. So let's succeed together. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. In this segment, I want to go over exam taking tips. Now, over the years, I've taken over 100 IT certification exams and passed more than 40 certifications. And I have tried many things, you know, through success and failure, I have learned a lot in this process. And I'm going to share my experience with you in form of these exam taking tips. So let's jump in. I'm sharing this document with you. So I'm going to walk through that and then talk about my approach, my exam, exam taking tips approach. All right. So as I said, over the years, I've taken many certification exams and I have learned a lot, not just by success. Remember, by success and failure as well. And this I have summarized below, right? So this is based on pro and I've tried many other things that may not have worked. So it's not here. So these are only things that has worked for me. And I've shared these tips with thousands of my learners and they seem to like it as well. So let's take a look at these tips and see if you like any of those. All right, here you go. Casey's tips. Take the exam while you're hot. This is number one tip. Why is it at number one? I don't have a number here, but this is my number one tip. What does it mean? For example, right, if you are taking, let's say, a cloud architect associate in, in any either Google or AWS or Azure you're taking the cloud architect certification exam you want to go into that exam hot meaning you're studying heavily you're putting quality time going into the exam you study eight hours ten hours a day for a few days at least a few days maybe a week maybe two weeks in that case depending upon your level of knowledge uh, going into the exam uh, your field if you're changing the field or not v varies right some people may need but at least have a few days of solid study time dedicated to this certification exam preparation go through all the material that you have been going through go outline that you have developed over time uh, make sure that you're going in hot right that's what i mean going in cold would be you know last a couple of days your work was busy or if you had family commitment and you couldn't study before that you studied but that's not going in hot that's what i mean you know going into the exam it should look like you're just continuing your practice you're just stepping into um, into the exam center but you are on a roll already right so it should be a continuation of what you're doing as in preparing on a high gear at the end and not really get cold or even warm going into the exam so very important so going in hard what has happened in my experience many many times is not only i get the questions more questions right but the questions that i'm not sure i go get those right as well because my guesses are better you know my guesses improve because i am hot going into the exam i have you know a lot of this material is is circling around my head right so that's what i mean going into the exam hot you're going to answer the questions correct you know the note that you're going to know more questions you're going to know answers to more questions. Not only that, but like I said, you will also correctly guess the questions, answers going in hot. Very important. All right. The second tip here is during the exam, step away after every 15 questions. Very important to step away. Why? Because right about that point in time, about 15 questions, in my opinion, you are going to start uh, getting some fatigue you're thinking differently you may not feel that you may feel oh you're just fine and i have experimented with this extensively but you break away from it you know 30 seconds to 45 seconds definitely not over a minute because that'll be waste of your time and you're gonna lose time right the exam is not gonna stop for you so you are on your own clock but 30 seconds of complete quiet time not think about this these exam questions think about something else 45 seconds at the most and then come back to this exam right so that is very important like a clockwise 15 questions get up 15 questions get up all right start reading the question at the call of the question 
this one I have experimented extensively as well. You know, you have facts for a question, then say, what would be blah, right? Best method, uh, best practice, least um, uh, expensive, most cost-effective method of doing this, something like that. Then you have A, B, C, and D options, for example. Start reading at the call of the question. And then scan the choices. Don't read them. If you read word for word, that's too much because you're going to read it momentarily again. So just scan the call, uh, answer choices, read the call of the question so you know what you're ready for. What is the question choices? Um, what are the question choices all about? And what you should be looking for? When you read the question, now, the fact pattern now, you're kind of ready for it. It works, you know, almost all the time. It eventually, if you practice with it, you will get better better at it initially it may feel like uh, it's not working but it has worked very well for me sometimes you know there's only one line question and in that case you're just not gonna have an option to do this but if it's two or three lines ideally three or more in two lines also you can straight away read questions but in three lines or more I would always go this route uh, even in two lines I go this route even in one line I go this route but uh, you know ideally it would work better for three lines or more three lines or longer question fact pattern with the question and choices but try with any any question it, it I use this exclusively in all my uh, certification exams all right so then like I said so that's what I'm describing here and then once you Re finish that scanning go back read the question it's sequentially now you're gonna go like normally you know it's not a waste of your time trust me if you develop this practice you're gonna be done with this question quicker on the long run than you may feel like you're reading it twice yes you're reading call of the question twice and once you just scan the choices but that's okay uh, you now have better grasp than you would just start because otherwise a lot of people reread the whole question and then call up the question so that's uh, you know even more waste of time or more use of your precious time so uh, then read the fact pattern and then try to eliminate right so these two are definitely wrong in your head uh, and then um, you know get to the last two choices that you think are close enough and go through the elimination process now if you are not 100% sure let me sc uh, scroll this down um, so you narrow this down and pick the best answer right so now if you're not 100% sure so you have this question here and then call up the question a b c d if you're not let's say you eliminated these two you're not 100 percent sure between the two right less than 100 percent even one percent less you mark it mark the question all the software uh, all soft uh, testing vendors have that option so mark the option mark the question and then uh, you will be able to get back to it less than anything less than 100%. You may have, let's say, 75%, right? Three out of four questions marked that way. That's okay. Don't worry about it. And then in the second pass, what you're going to do is go to only the marked questions because less than 100%. Now you kind of see what you are 50% or more sure and mark those because time is probably running out for you. So now you have to make some discount, 50% uh, uh, or more content confident unmark those uh, questions right uh, unmark those and then third pass you know now you have let's say you started with uh, 50 questions in the first pass you mark 35 in the, the first pass in the second pass now you mark let's say 15 questions um, and then in the third pass so in the second pass uh, this this would from here to there you reduce it down to 50% uh, no, this was 100%, right? So first to the second step is if you're less than 100% sure, then you mark. Here you're less than 50% sure, then those are the 15 questions. You go again one more time. Now this time, the fourth pass, what you're going to do, no percentage, but you're going to see that whether you ran out of your knowledge limit. If there's something that you have no clue, something that you don't think that you'll be able to recall, you haven't seen before, you know, you just unmark them, you know, uh, pick an answer that you have picked or, you know, make another guess at this point and unmark them. So reduce 15 down to, let's say, five questions in the fourth pass. And then, you know, go through it one more time if you have to. 
and uh, eliminate all of them. Get, your goal is to get this down to zero. And, you know, sometimes I don't get it down to zero. I just leave it at five because those still I'm not, I'm not sure, but I have reached my limit. Then you move on to this uh, one last thing. If you have time, obviously, this you have to manage the time. And it comes with practice. That's why you have to practice with a lot of practice questions. Uh, exam quality practice questions, similar degree of difficulty, similar length, you know, not just uh, uh, easy questions or something, you know, off the internet. Uh, anyway, so if none of the question is marked at this point right or say you, you still mark but you have no clue anymore so you don't want to worry about those uh, maybe unmark it or leave it marked that's fine but now at this point I would ask you to just jump randomly right so what you do is randomly go to different questions uh, 23 39 11 15 19 uh, instead of going sequentially one two three because you know sometimes what happens is your mind is more active uh, in the beginning so you, you start going sequentially and you reach 10 and those 10 you probably answered when you were very fresh right so go randomly in this random order pick some from the beginning some from the middle some from the end and then answer those questions uh, or double check your answers for those questions uh, change but you know eventually you have to use your gut and you have to use your uh, intuition at that point if for the questions that you're not 100 percent sure and you know if you practice with this method i guarantee you you will improve dramatically uh, it has worked very well for me and this is again one of those things that I've been sharing throughout this and many of my courses my experience and expertise over more than two decades of taking so many exams passing those achieving certifications writing training programs helping tens of thousands of learners this is sort of culmination of my exam tips for IT certification courses I have another one for the law students as well which is slightly different but this one works very well for that IT technology uh, certification so Make sure to try this again in your practice, uh, especially in all my practice exam related courses, questions that I have, you know, I have 180 to 300 questions for each one of the cloud certifications. At the time of your viewing, I may not have for all the exams out there, but I have a game plan. I'm working towards it. I have many already done and I'm publishing on a regular basis. And also there are many other resources you should tap onto for a given certification exam make sure to do many practice exam questions and go through this approach the tips that i have been sharing with you if it makes sense to you uh, you cannot just enter the exam and try all these tips for the first time you have to practice with it to make sure that you're comfortable with it and you understand i mean yeah some of them you can perhaps like get up every 15 questions you can definitely try straight away first time but uh, in some of my courses in some of my uh, offerings i have like a full sim full scale simulation exam exact number of questions similar rubric uh, for example if you know they have uh, cloud com uh, compute engine for what percentage so i follow those and then similar type of uh, timing that i choose in exact same timing that you're allowed to complete that test so you can practice with those and that's going to help you to master this and really pass this uh, certification exam on your next attempt so give it a shot and do let me know if your feedback you know positive negative uh, if uh, there are any other tips that has worked for you um, then let me know i can certainly share with my learning community as well so that should do it for this case's exam taking tips for it certifications make sure to practice with it before uh, you take the actual certification exam then if you have any question feel free to reach out to me through communication channels thank you very much i look forward to see you bye bye Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. In this segment, I would like to walk you through my outlining process, the approach, how it works, what is it, and should you use it or not. Okay, so let me give you some background. I have lots of writing experience, two decades of it. I'm also admitted lawyer in State Bar of California, as well as patent attorney with USPTO. So over years, I have developed this outlining technique of my own. In the law school, outlining is very common. 
However, I have sort of mixed the law and technology in my methodology of outlining, and I'll walk you through. And it has worked very well for me. I, I manage enormous amount of information using this approach, and I can easily find what is where and recall things that you know once I knew very well, but I don't anymore because I you know have so much uh, limited uh, uh, real estate here. So I need to make sure that I, I use my outline efficiently. So I'm going to walk you through the process. And if it works for you, if it's something interesting for you, uh, you should try it and see if it works. And I can assure you that over time you get more and more efficient. So uh, give it some time if you if you uh, ever give it a try. And it's absolutely optional. If you're not interested, just click on the continue and move on to the next lecture. But it has been very instrumental to many. I have received very good feedback and I can tell you that. Um, you know, it works really well for me because, you know, I have uh, multiple cloud certifications. I'm a lawyer. I have a technology, I work in technology space, and I do many, many things. And there's no way I can manage that without this approach. So uh, I want to share that with you. You know, this is a million dollar approach, uh, if you will. Just kidding, but it, it could be really important for some of you. So here it goes, right? This document is available to you as a PDF download in this lecture as well as in the resources lecture. Okay, so what I have for you are templates for Google Cloud, AWS. I'm working on Azure as well. It will be updated for you. So the start with the template. It has all the topics that you need to know. And this covers all certifications for Google Cloud, all certifications for AWS. Now, they all come up with new products and services, but they don't necessarily make it into the certification exam for a year or two or even more or never, depending upon the, the type of product, right? Uh, however, if you find that some topic is not in my template, go ahead and add it. Let me know. I will add it as well. This is a Google Drive document shared publicly, so you can download it as well. Links are available in this document, and this document, once again, is available as a download to this lecture, as well as download in the resources lecture. Right, so I'm going to click on that uh, momentarily, but let me walk you through uh, what I'm trying to suggest and see if it makes sense to you. I recommend copying, first of all. If you're doing Google Cloud certification, go ahead and, and click on the Google. And if you're doing multi-cloud, you can download both as well. Uh, so I recommend copying this outline. You know, you can copy on Google Drive. You can copy from my shared drive to yours and make your own or make a copy of that. That's fine. You will not be able to update this one because it's a read-only. Uh, I have shared it in a read-only mode. So you can download it, uh, you know, as a Word file. However you want it consume it. That's up to you. My recommendation is keep it on Google Drive so you can update from your phone. Uh, you can update from your tablet or uh, anywhere, right? So the standard benefit of cloud computing applies there. So start with the above outline for all topics, and that's again just the template. I'll go through that. The goal is to build this outline along your learning journey, right? So you're gonna f you're gonna fill in the blanks. You're gonna put information as you learn, and what my recommendation there is the following: the key is to keep a good balance. This is the key. A lot of times, myself included, when I was new to the outlining, everything I found, I put it in the outline. And then it becomes a book and you never read it, right? So the goal is to strike a balance between not make it a book, but make your own outline, make it your own document that you would want to refer, right? So something that is not obvious to you when you're putting it in, right? If it is, uh, you know, to you know, to the sky is blue. You don't need to put it in there, right? If it's uh, today is Monday, you just don't need to put it in there. Uh, you want to make sure that you strike a good balance, right? How would you strike it? So only add information that's new to you at the time, right? Uh, you will learn along the way what is new today will be obvious to you in the future, and I talk about that later. Uh, but it seems to be important for your certification exam, right? So again, if it's something that is cool, you know, MIT researchers ran 220,000 cores on a thing, you know, in the Google Cloud, that's very good news, but it shouldn't go to your outline. That's not important for your certification exam. 
exam that's important maybe you should go to your uh, OneNote or Evernote or Cape or however you want to store your information there right it doesn't belong to your outline for certification exam preparation keep that in mind right now if it is obvious to you while adding no need to add it right as I mentioned if it's very obvious even while you're adding it remember in the hindsight a lot of these things will be obvious it's okay to add it now but if it's obvious at the time of adding doesn't add any value to this outline don't do it for example I've given an example cloud computing is growing and more and more companies are using cloud computing well if it is new to you um, at this point I mean dramatically new if you are really changing your field from accounting to IT sure maybe even then I would question this is common knowledge right you don't need to write that information that cloud computing is growing this is more this is this note is not worth adding to your outline because it, it should be obvious to you and like I said if it's even if it's not obvious it doesn't make sense I mean it should be common knowledge and it doesn't belong to certification exam preparation outline on the other hand, if you come across something very difficult, you know, you, you came across some command that deploys virtual servers in AWS and Google and Azure, and, you know, right now it's new to you, maybe down the road it wouldn't add it in to your outline so that it is not obvious, it's something you want to recall. Right now it is, you know, for you, a lot of times it happens to me, I feel that, oh, I know this stuff, you know, I don't need to write it, but month later two months later when you move on to other things you forget what that was right so you want to put it in your outline so you can go back to it you don't have to search the internet internet has uh, uh, you know a lot of information and it's now a problem of really filtering the right information and that takes time you don't want to waste your time there um, okay so if you come across uh, any relevant picture or screenshot I'll show you the template um, which makes sense again same principle it's not obvious to you and it's worth uh, the space in your outline remember goal is not to make it a book goal is to contain your outline to a reasonable number of pages that you want to refer to it you want to go back to you know search on it, right so if the screenshot uh, you can take a screenshot of a picture or you can uh, you know just right click and save the picture and then paste it in your outline now i have a specific outline format you know i just use uh, the bullet list with the indentation so you know where you are you want to see uh, you know i believe in uh, see the forest and see the trees oftentimes I just want to see the forest at a you know very high level view but then other times I want to see the trees I want to go deep down I will see even the leaves of the tree right if that's the case right you want to have your outline you want to be able to zoom in and out so it's designed in that way that you can go if you're in compute you want to go now deep into auto scaling and now deep into the timers of auto scaling right so you know that you are in the forest of uh, say Google Cloud or AWS and you're auto scaling and you're down that level so you can up level it also if you want if you just have all the information everywhere it's gonna be hard right so if you come across screenshot put it at the end of the document I have that for you and you can uh, do like internal linking on a Google Drive as well so it's just link from there to there or just you know put some notes that you can search on it that this is uh, diagram or a graph or a picture for something you know this topic and then you can search on it to get there uh, and you should take screenshot from the CLI you know from the command line or whatever however you are consuming this information I personally use TechSmith Snagit for screen capturing it's really good I've been using it for over 15 years um, Mac and Windows both have uh, built-in screen uh, screen clipping software uh, you know with the keystrokes and stuff you can use those if that work for you um, but you know for $25 uh, I think uh, Snagit is a reasonable software it, it works for me but it may not it may be overkill for for you if you're not gonna use it that much but I use it a lot so um, once again take screenshots and what what you need to to do that to because you know once again this information is very useful to you at this point if it's not obvious you want to take at least you know a clip of it put it in there again I'm going to show you what you should do over time you should trim it out as well right but at this point you should put it in if it makes sense to you all right uh, you should be able to read this outline and recall topics that are important for certification exam or professional use and these topics are hard for you now 
or were hard for you at the time at the point in the past right so i as i mentioned before you want to make sure that uh, you only clip and put what is important to you again the same message reiterated however over time right so let's say you are taking you're studying for i'll take you know uh, three examples you're studying for google certified uh, cloud professional architect and you're studying for AWS Solution Architect Associate, and you're studying for Azure uh, Architecting Azure Solutions, right? So those three exams or any one or combination thereof, right? So you start three different outlines and you start adding material. Now your exam is next week for those one of those topics, and you're going through the outline. At this point, what is obvious to you? you should remove it, uh, meaning it is second nature. You already know this is now laughable that, you know, it's in your outline in a way, not not quite laughable, obviously, but you think that, oh, I didn't even know that. And that would happen. It is likely to happen. It should happen. That means you're learning. You're learning new material. You know, uh, in the past, you did not know. Now you know this stuff. So uh, that happens to everyone. But what I recommend is you trim your outline, right? You may have 20 page or 30 page outline. You should trim what is obvious to you and what is not what you're making mistake right you do all the practice questions that I have all the other instructors have all the other material that you're gonna come across in your preparation it's in there and based on that now you're studying and then you trim out so your outline the way it would it would happen is initially your outline would grow and then as you get closer your outline will go back it will start shrinking because now you know so much that you didn't know, not that you ha don't have enough material, now you know the stuff that you didn't know before. So more it shrinks, more you know in a way, but don't cut it too much because think about it that what you what you know now or what's in the outline for solution architect uh, associate certification will be necessary or baseline for professional certification so when you go there you may forget depending upon you go next month or next year or two years later right so you want to keep some of that but you know trim responsibly but think about this formula that you're gonna sh grow and then shrink so it's manageable it's in, uh, less number of pages and something that is important and relevant for you it has worked miracles for me i'm telling you i've taken you know like i said taken many 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 exams and uh, without this process it is next to impossible now for me i use this method even if uh, i'm writing a, a document i'm writing a speech or i am um, you know doing anything literally you know planning an event even i start with an outline uh, so everything is for me starts with an outline pretty much everything and then i flesh it out i look at the forest i look at the trees and, and and the leaves sometimes so that's my approach now let me show you the links here so we can take a look at together and I show you what I mean so I'm clicking on Google Cloud link there and then while it's loading I'll also click on AWS and like I said I'm working on Azure template as well so in here let's start with Google here so you have the template here is a view only you can uh, you can download it's a file and make a copy or download as um, there's also a way to save it to your uh, share drive as well um, you will find it somewhere there. but those are the options that would work and I have kind of anchors here for the rest of this so in the beginning it's just right here the beginning of the template but you can also on a Mac just uh, click on it and option enter will take you there uh, similarly on Windows uh, control enter uh, so beginning of the template and I have like I said forest and the tree view right so you see here uh, beginning of the template I have very high level cloud computing uh, topics here uh, and then you have architecture networking compute so it sort of builds on and then I have also indentation for various topics within that so these are my trees or leaves and then maybe this is a leaf this is my tree this is my forest right so things like that and then you find some information about it put it in here and then like I said if you have a, a screenshot it's at the end you can also go from here option enter takes you to a screenshot you can just copy and paste um, say I want to take a screenshot of this screen right here I just take this and then paste it here 
right so that's just a screenshot then I just paste it uh, so that's uh, that's a gist of it for example let me give you a concrete example right so you came across a uh, information like I said cloud computing is great you don't need to put it here but you can say that uh, hybrid cloud computing is more prevalent in the industry today okay let's correct the spelling prevalent for example okay uh, compute cloud computing google cloud you can say that google cloud uses the same infra for their gmail youtube for example and that may be new to it was new to me and it may be new to you at this point right uh, for vpc for example right something that's uh, interesting to you say a range for cider is slash 8 to slash 29 for example and uh, that's new to you but you don't have to say that vpc stands for virtual private cloud now this should be obvious if not you can write it now and hopefully in a day or so you should be crossing it out you can also use the strike out method that i use like for example you can select it here and then format text strike out you can use that uh, shortcut as well so you know that this is not important eventually you can delete it maybe you can take that as a first step before you delete and then eventually if you're still comfortable then uh, delete it or just unstrike out make it normal if that's what you want to do similarly in aws right you can uh, you can go to aws and and say that you know um, identity and access management iam roles can be applied to resources for example you know that may be new initially things like that whatever you're learning you go to the website and you come across something so let's say you you're searching on google cloud say google cloud command to create a virtual machine and you enter and let's say you come across creating virtual machine instance and you go in there g cloud command right there so g cloud g cloud compute instances create let's say this command i want to write down either you can copy the command or you can also do like a screen share uh, screen screen capture and then go in there remember i told you screen capture should be put at the end so it doesn't destroy your format and you can just add there and in the compute section i put it in aws by mistake go to google and you could here and then put it in there and then in the compute section you can then say let's go to compute section create a vm from g cloud this is screenshot or you can at least you can also say g cloud compute instances create for example that would be your command right so you can just say dollar something like that right okay so the point is just make it your own and that should help you all right so this should do it for this outlining sorry it was a bit longer than i expected but i wanted to give you all my mind music my insight what's going on why i came up with it again very optional uh, try if it works for you it has worked very well for me and many of my learners um, and if it doesn't work uh, just use your uh, current method not a problem uh, just continue on and if it doesn't work, uh, then you can stop using it as well. Thank you very much. Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. Let's succeed together. Thank you. Well, well, well. Believe me or not, you made it through this course. Congratulations. I am super proud of your grit and commitment throughout this course. Job well done. One thing I would recommend is to keep checking this course for latest updates. Even if you have finished this course 100%, you've reached the conclusion and beyond and you're finished, but you haven't taken or passed your certification exam, make sure to check this. How would you know? 
I'll keep an eye on educational announcements. I do send out regular educational announcements in this course. You will receive it via email. You will also receive it as a notification in Udemy portal. And you will know that if I added material via that. Now remember, this course is like cloud computing. It is elastic. My course content keeps growing. Why? Because I want to give a lot more to my learners. Oftentimes, a vendor also make changes to their curriculum, to the blueprint, the rubric. I quickly make updates to my documentation, to my courses as well. And as a result, you're going to see more content for your course. So it is elastic. It's going to keep growing over time. Uh, so you should keep checking once again before you pass your certification exam. Another aspect is there is a section called contents based on your feedback. So my learners give me very valuable feedback via private messages here on Udemy and other communication channels. And I do take those seriously. I do incorporate those. As a result, I add the content, which sometimes otherwise doesn't fit into the flow I have for the rest of the courses. Then I would add it to the contents based on learners feedback or your feedback so uh, let me know if your feedback if you have any obviously it has to be reasonable it has to be something relevant and all that and if i find that i can fairly quickly add that to this content based on your feedback another section at the end of this course is uh, called casey's mind music section uh, what is it i can assure you that there are no songs in there it is a mind music playing in my head. I'm constantly thinking about the course material, thinking about my learners, taking their feedback in. And I have so much more material for additional courses or even this course. But having an idea in my head and converting that into consumable lecture or material by you in this course, it does take some time. So what I have come up with is in this section, I'm going to post somewhat raw material, right? I, will, I might just record on my iPhone and then just post it here, something that I'm working on. But it's important for you if you are taking an exam in the near future or some idea that came to me that never made it to this course. So that's the point of uh, keep checking the course content for this course again well after you finish and the course you will reach the conclusion stage but before you have taken and passed your certification exam keep checking it maybe put in a reminder if you want or at least look out for my educational announcements and emails and the udemy messages here that would give you an idea of what is this elastic content, what content got added to what section. Uh, you know, I have multiple sections, as I mentioned to you. I have resources. I may add resources there. I have uh, course content, obviously. I may add section or lectures into that. Then I have contents based on your feedback section that I talked about. I have cases, my music for raw material that I talked about. And of course, Q&A and other forums would help you as well if you keep checking the course content. It is my request to you that keep me posted, keep me posted all along this course. So when you're making progress or even when you're not making progress, maybe keep me posted so I can help you. I can jump on a WebEx Zoom meeting and we can be on the phone and I can get you moving forward. Remember, I offer one free hour of training, one free hour of guidance to all my active learners. You can take advantage of that as well. Keep me posted when you schedule an exam because I can also hop on a web conference with you to make sure that you are well prepared going into the exam. Now, there's no guarantee if I say you're prepared and you don't pass it or vice versa, it could happen. Has happened, happens, you know, uh, now and then. But But generally speaking, I can gauge whether you are able to or you're ready you're prepared and you're likely to pass or not right so give me that opportunity if you can again it's free of cost to you no charge and after you take the test whether you pass or don't pass do let me know because i care once again if you don't make it we need to have a game plan going forward if you do make it if you pass the exam then let's celebrate you know we can uh, certainly 
uh, have an online uh, celebration so to speak i do have a hall of fame hello hall of fame on my website and i would be happy to add your name and if you want to provide any blur with a return or audio or video everything is optional even to get on hello hall of fame is optional but i care about your success i care about being part of your journey i want to be part of your journey with your help so uh, you know i'm in touch with a lot of my learners even decade later i've taught like i said tens of thousands of learners over my career and many dozens of those i'm still in touch uh, well after a decade of uh, being a student a lot of them have become my uh, partners employees uh, co-instructors teaching assistants so if you once you pass the exam and if you have some passion to join me as a ta or as a as an co-instructor for other courses do let me know i would love to collaborate i would love to explore that opportunity with you if you are passionate about it i'm looking for passionate and driven people and uh, if you are one of those do let me know once again thank you very much for signing up for this course it is my tremendous honor to have you on board in this course thank you very much signing out